well. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think that we can start with a round of introductions. And um, I know we are expecting more people. So uh, yeah, if, I think if we can kind of, well, the introductions will take a good 15 minutes at least. Um, <laughs> so I think we can basically start uh, whenever. Like I said, I just want to get this live stream link posted. Yeah, I can help out um, starting with introductions right now. It's 10 o'clock. Um, thank you everybody who joined us early and who's still joining us now. Um, I, I really can't thank people enough for thinking about us and taking this time on a Saturday to be with us. Um, so I think that it would be a good idea to start out, um, you know, introducing your name, where you're from, and um, maybe a little bit about what inspires you um, to come into the Green Party. I think so many of us come in with um, issues that are really important to us. And so it's kind of nice to know um, what people, what really lights people's fire. Um, and, and that could be multiple things. Like I definitely was in the peace movement and um, doing environmental stuff and also um, educational issues when I joined. Um, so uh, I'll just have us go down the list and. Barb, let me um, echo. I think that's a, that's a great idea for introductions. I would just add, please keep it to one minute or less mm -hmm. uh, so that we can get, get through our intros in a timely fashion because many of us have long and impressive uh, activists bios yeah um, that's true <laughs> but you know there's 20 people and counting if everyone takes five minutes um you know we'll be at lunch before we start our agenda so um yeah so uh yeah. please uh keep your remarks to one minute or less and that's all pass so um, I'm Barbara Dahlgren. I'm the co-chair of the Wisconsin Green Party right now for um, my final day with you guys as co-chair. And I'm from West Dallas, Wisconsin, which is right next to Milwaukee. And I already said a little bit about myself. So um, Tom is next. Tom, uh, there's so many Toms. Hang oh, on. yeah. So I'll go quick. Um, so I, I just nominate myself. So my issues, so I have this in my head, um, focusing on peace, uh, climate change, and then the economic area of uh, monetary reform and public banking, and my contribution to the Green Party being uh, in involvement in committees and IT support uh, from the Milwaukee area. Pass. Um, Bill Bryan. Um, Bill Bryan from Milwaukee. Uh, I am the operations treasurer for Wisconsin Greens. I have, uh, I'm retired now. I had 40 plus years involvement in the labor movement and the socialist movement. And I'd just like to say that the Green Party is a great place for socialists to be today, since we are all basically eco-socialists. Pass. Um, Dave? Hey, Dave Schwab here. Um, I am in Madison with the Four Lakes Green Party. I'm co-chair of the Wisconsin Green Party. I use he, him pronouns. Um, Barb and I will be facilitating the meeting today. And um, I've been involved with the Green Movement for a long time. Um, Recently, I've worked on the Jill Stein for President campaign. Uh, I worked on the Howie Hawkins for President campaign and the Lisa Savage for U.S. Senate campaign. Um, I've also worked as a volunteer on many local campaigns uh, here in the Madison area and in Wisconsin. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about our ballot access fight uh, a bit later. Yeah. Um, pass. 
Monty. Hello. Um, I've been uh, with the Green Party for a long time. My name is Monty, and I'm in West Dallas. And uh, kind of first tried to get started around 1990-ish. Uh, then I uh, made another effort around 1998. Um, I keep dropping out and coming back. I tend to volunteer for more than I do. And uh, uh, I'm an anti-ismist. Pass. Uh, Tomas. Hey, I'm Tomas Ward. I'm in Plymouth uh, in the North Kettle Moraine country. And I'm involved as a sporadic volunteer with the Greens, um, doing some IT stuff, some election stuff, and uh, always appreciate the Green green candidates that run pass um let's see jeff reese jeff are you there We may have to come back to Jeff. Addendum, uh, if you don't have your town on your name, um, I'm going to do it for you. If you don't want me to, yeah, say no, something now. Uh, oh, that sounds like Jeff. Oh, there you are, Jeff. Jeff, we can hear you. Yeah. Jeff, we can hear you now. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, uh, 17 people are bad connection I, I think the sound yeah i think the connection yeah, is bad here. uh jeff we, we actually can't hear you very well okay it sounds like there's a connection problem um, so. anyway uh, i'm moving Uh, My computer is saying Jeff's bandwidth is low. Bandwidth. Uh, yeah, Jeff, we um, we can't really hear you very well. If you could try to resolve your connection problem. I, I then, think it's, it's mainly yeah, yeah, the okay. volume slow. No, it's laggy. It's laggy. So, uh, so Jeff, if if you could try to improve your connection, and we'll try to come back to you. Otherwise, maybe you can type up an intro and put it into the chat, but we got to keep moving here. Um, so who's next, Barb? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, um, Jennifer Kudrowski. Oh, me? <laughs> uh, okay, no. What was I supposed to say? Uh, okay, well, uh, I'm Jennifer. Uh, I'm in Brookfield, over by Milwaukee. And... Uh, well, I've been uh, working on the, the Milwaukee Green Party website to update it. The phone keeps falling down and trying to prop it up. And that, well, unfortunately, I um, kind of got bogged down with the uh, homework from school. So I've been neglecting to do that. <laughs> so, and why am I doing it? Uh, well, I was, uh, at one point I was looking to see who was running for president and then I just happened to discover Jill Stein and he's like, oh, this Green Party sounds good. He's like, he sounds a lot like me, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Um, We've got Andrea next. Andrea. Yeah, hi. So um, my name, yeah, I'm Andrea Builder. I'm in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and I uh, voted for Jill last time, voted for Howie this time. I'm, I'm uh, really kind of horrified by the choices we're getting. And um, I'm Unlike, it seems like so many, much of the country, I'm pretty terrified about what's coming in this new administration. I don't think it'll get reported, but there'll be 
more war, there'll be uh, the TPP resurrected um, and our environmental laws will be subject to fines by corporations, um, which I think is, is really horrific. So I'm, uh, I, yeah, I, I really like the green policies. I can't think of one I disagree with. I um, was asked to look into green educational policy by a friend in California who is concerned about too much religion in the schools, I think. And I, and then I saw how detailed and, and good uh, the green, the National Green website is in terms of just laying out uh, policy on on so many fronts and getting into real detail and and uh, yeah, happy to be green and happy to be here. Looking forward to the talks. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Um, let's see, people are being rearranged. So let me make sure I, I get everybody. Barb Eisenberg. Let's unmute you. Oh, how's that? Very good. Oh, okay. Um, I'm assuming I'm just introducing myself. <laughs> Um, I'm Barb Eisenberg, as opposed to Barbara Dahlgren, if you want to uh, distinguish us, <laughs> two different Barbs in the Milwaukee area. Uh, I've been involved with the Greens since about 2000, when I found Ralph and the party and, um, and was with the party through the amazing years of, you know, the early 2000s, which were great, 2006, and we had some great um, candidates for governor and um, I've been less active and more active and and hoping to um, and now I've been uh, treasurer and for the Milwaukee Greens for a couple years so I'm staying involved that way um, but really enjoy any time I get to to spend with Greens because it's you're my people <laughs> thanks Thanks, Barb. Um, next, we've got Corey. Hello, uh, Corey Hageman. I live in Janesville. I teach fifth grade in Beloit. Um, I got into the ideas of the Green Party uh, sometime after 2000. I, 2002 was the first election I could vote in. But I read Crashing the Party, um, Ralph Nader's book, at some point before 2004, I know. Um, I just maybe for five years I've been on the email list and this is the first year that I went out and got some signatures and I enjoyed doing that and I just want to get a little more involved. Um, obviously as a teacher education is important to me um, but my, my real priority is just having government that people can trust again and good government that works and I think it's kind of a symbiotic relationship it has to government has to improve but then trust will improve and then as trust improves, government can improve. So thank you. Thanks, Corey. Um, next is Daniel. I don't know if we have more than one Daniel here. Daniel H. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Daniel Hashke. Um, I'm, I live in Madison. Um, I've uh, kind of came into the Green Party after uh, being burned out by uh, Bernie Sanders, not making it through uh, the Democratic uh, candidacy and trying to not compromise my values and really appreciating the, um, the fact that the Green Party is um, focused around like four concrete pillars. So you, like, you know like what they stand for. Um, yeah. And I helped out uh, with getting signatures for Howie Hawkins this year. And that's kind of how I started getting involved with the Green Party. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Dennis Boyer. Hello, Dennis Boyer here in Iowa County, Southwest Wisconsin. I started with the Greens in uh, about the late, mid to late 1980s. Thanks, Dennis. Great to see you, Dennis. Yeah. Um, Dennis has written a couple of pretty green books. 
Yeah, he, he also helps out with our elections committee uh, and some of our other committees periodically. So thank you. Um, next, we've got Greg Banks. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I also um, became involved with the Greens in the early 80s and uh, have served in many capacities over the years. It's been such a blessing to be able to serve that way. Um, and I think, you know, what resonated with me with the Green Party was the holistic approach to, you know, um, the environment and um, grassroots democracy and just all the areas that the Green Party touches in our lives. So um, as a spiritual being that really resonated with me and I've been involved ever since in one way or another. And uh, I'm in Milwaukee, Greater Milwaukee Green Party. Go Green. Thanks, Greg. Next we've got Jacobs. Are you with us, Jeff? Oh, you're muted. Me? Uh, Jeff also has a intro in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, I've not been looking at the chat, sorry. Um, he says, I'm Jeffrey Jacobs, activist and former assembly candidate from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, looking for opportunities to run for office in the future. Um, Jeff, that is a very humble um, rec recognition of yourself because Jeff um, camped out in his front yard for a month to get his signatures and made the local news actually made the regional news about it. Um, so um, thank you, Jeff, for all the work that you've done on, on campaigning this year. It's, it's been quite, uh, it's been very unusual to say the least. Thank you. Um, let's see, next we've got, I have to get back to the participants. Um, I've Jesse to, Lewis. I've been asked to be the timekeeper and just to remind everyone we need to move this along to be able to complete our business agenda this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. A great reminder. Um, I, also, I wanted to make another quick um, announcement, which is, so if um, if your name, your name should include your first and last name um, so that, you know, we know who is in the meeting with us. Um, you know, it, it's important just that we make sure who we know who we're with. Uh, for example, someone in the uh, participants list is Pixel 4, which I'm sure is your device. Um, if you click on participants, and then at the top of the participants list, it should be you. So if your first and last name aren't there, then please uh, hover over your name, click rename, and then enter your first and last name. You, uh, it would also be great if you could then enter your um, location. Uh, you can enter uh, your pronouns if you like. Um, and yeah, uh, so and I also see at least one person who just has a first name in there. Um, okay, I think that's been fixed. So great, thanks everyone. Um, pass. We were at Jeffrey Lewis. Yeah, um, Jeffrey Lewis, I live in Madison and have been um, more or less connected with the Greens probably since it's been, well in the 90s for sure. Um, and my, my primary interest is around uh, kind of a moral you know, place-centered economy and an economy that serves connecting people to each other and to the places that they live. 
Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, do we have Haley here? Hi, I'm Haley Bazak. I live in Glenwood City, uh, which is close to the Minnesota border, close to the Twin Cities. Um, I'm newer to the Green Party. Um, I've been following the Green Party since the previous election, but have not been active thus far. Well, welcome, Haley. Um, I think we've got Jessica next. Hello, I'm Jessica. Um, I am relatively new to Madison. I've been here three years now and uh, very new to the Green Party. I joined a week and a half ago um, because I saw somebody saying uh, we need a real alternative to, uh, you know, the two party system. I was like, dang, that's really true. Um, and of course, the Green Party aligned most closely with uh, what I already uh, believe it's important to fight for. Um, I am technically a college student, not very good at it, especially this semester. Um, so I'm hoping to take a break next semester and uh, see what I can uh, see what I can do uh, for the for the Green Party. I would really like to volunteer, but I'm not I'm not exactly sure what uh, what skills I have to offer. Uh, but yeah, very, very excited uh, to be here. Uh, pass. Yeah, welcome, Jessica. Um, next, we've got Joe Nathan. Hey, people. Uh, hello, Greens. Um, I'm here in Ashland, Wisconsin. And uh, I was involved, got involved in the Green Party uh, at the Millennial with uh, Ralph Nader and Winona LaDuke Le and took about 15 years into the desert of New Mexico and Arizona and uh, really focused on indigenous anarchism and uh, food sovereignty at that point. And uh, right now we've, uh, <laughs> I'm a family and farm. Uh, we, we run a sustainable, uh, you're on TV, Adok. Yeah. This is my son, Adok. <laughs> but uh, well, yeah, uh, I feel a little bit like we've gone through the dark of the night on these last four years, uh, and I'm I'm uh, maybe naively uh, optimistic about. Uh, I feel like um, you know if we can just get the next uh, corporate fascist in, the real fascists are out, <laughs> and. Uh, I don't know. I'm hopeful that the democracy in America can produce changes and, um, you know, looking for a better future and, and the Greenway is, is that way. And, um, you know, uh, that's the long and the short. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Joe Nathan. Next, we've got Carrie Bruss. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Carrie Bruss, uh, born and raised in West Dallas, Wisconsin, currently living in Waukesha County. I'm relatively new to the Green Party. I just joined earlier this year, um, but have um, been involved in environmental anti-war and feminist activism for some time. Um, happy to see you all here today. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Mary. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, I joined a year and a half ago. I grew up in Columbus, Wisconsin. I currently live in north of Madison. Um, it was the Green Party's plank on monetary reform, calling for stopping bank lending of all our money supply and having the government create the money. And that's why I have a conflict this weekend. It's the American Monetary Institute uh, annual conference on another channel, but I wanted to tune in for a minute with you all because I appreciate your work so much and I'm uh, happy to be part of Wisconsin Greens. Thanks, Mary. Next, we've got Melissa. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Melissa Minkoff. I'm from Madison. Um, 
I only officially joined the Green Party this year, but um, as a longtime supporter uh, of Ralph Nader, I've been familiar with the Green Party and, and um, I campaigned, helped campaign for Ralph Nader in the past. And uh, so as somebody who is really concerned about foreign policy and the environment, the Green Party platform has always kind of meshed really well with my personal ideals. And um, that's about all I can think of to say. <laughs> Thanks, glad to be here. Thank you. Um, let's see, Mike McAllister. Hi, uh, I'm Mike McAllister. I live in West Dallas and am co-chair of the Greater Milwaukee Green Party. Uh, I've been involved with the Greens uh, since roughly 1999 uh, and have been a fighter for uh, uh, independent working class political action uh, for practically my whole life. Uh, I uh, <clears throat> I am currently an alternate to the National Committee uh, and am trying to uh, immerse myself in uh, uh, the movements for a Green New Deal uh, and, uh, and justice. Uh, I sign all my emails, peace, justice, and solidarity. That's what brings me to the Greens. Uh, welcome to all the new people today. Great to meet you all. Thanks, Mike. Um, Patty. Hi, everyone. I'm Patty Ashby from Milwaukee. Um, I uh, joined the Greens in 2016. I was um, a Republican. Then I was a Democrat. And then I became a Green. Um, you know, um, just lifelong learning, I'd say. Um, anyway, I am the um, Greater Milwaukee Membership Committee Chair, and I'm also the um, Wisconsin Green Party um, Membership Outreach Chair. And I am passionate about seeing the Green Party grow and um, am committed to seeing a third party option. So it's great to see so many here today. Thank you all for being here and I'm looking forward to the day. Thanks, Patty. Next, we've got Randall. Yes, my name is Randall fulton -Evich. I live in Waukesha, Wisconsin, by way of Lombard, Illinois. I am extremely passionate about destroying the military, about universal basic income, eliminating homelessness. Um, criminal justice reform, as well as saving the environment. Pass. Thanks, Randall. Um, we have uh, Randy Toller. Oh, there's something wrong with the audio. Um, I'm not hearing anything on my end. Um, you can introduce yourself in the chat or um, try and get the audio he, issue. He, he's muted. Well, he, he was unmuted too. And, and he does have an intro in the chat. Okay, cool. We will come back. <laughs> um, next is Rick. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rick Lurchie. Um, I um, came to the Greens in the early 20 teens, looking for an alternative to the Democratic Party. Um, I moved back to Wisconsin from North Carolina in May and rejoined the Greens. And uh, uh, the party meshes with my values. And I'm also a socialist, and I just want to get rid of capitalism. Pass. Thanks. Next, we've got Sam, uh, Samuel Chance. Hi, uh, I'm Sam. Um, I'm in Madison. Um, officially joined the Green Party this year, but have been a uh, 
supporter of green politics and um, leftist politics, anti-war, um, you know, I mean, a lot of the, the same views that have been already expressed. I don't need to express them myself again. Um, glad to be here. Uh, I'll pass. Yeah, good to see you, Sam. Next, we've got Thistle. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I live in Madison. I am a longtime environmental activist. I've been coordinate, coordinating the community garden at Sherman Terrace, where I live uh, for the last five years. Um, and I really believe in the power of finding common ground and coming together in our local communities to learn about the ecosystem that we depend upon and to become you know, caregivers to each other and to the ecosystem. I've been doing green politics for years, but I've just recently joined the Wisconsin Green Party. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Thistle. Next, we've got Thomas Smith. Hi. Uh, so I'm Tom, and I joined um, just very recently, like within the last week. Um, so I'm basically just here because I'm looking for a better alternative, better party that actually represents the issues that I care about. So before this, I was a Democrat and now I'm trying to find something better than that after this uh, previous few years. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm in the Wauwatosa area. So yeah, I'm probably gonna try and find some volunteer opportunities at some point. Welcome, good to have you. Um, we also have Cody. Hello, I'm Cody Arndt. I'm from Plover, Wisconsin. Uh, I've been disillusioned with our government for years, uh, since high school. Um, I voted, voted Ralph, voted Jill, voted Howie. I've self-identified as a green. It's put up or shut up now, so I figured I might as well join and actually see how I can help more. Awesome, thank you. And Eric? Eric DeVries. Yes. Um, hi, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so my name is Eric, obviously. I, uh, I'm here because I, like some people have said, I am disillusioned with the two-party system and how it sort of seems to exist to limit the choices that people have um, for uh, presidential and candidates down the ballot. Um, I do a lot of video production and I'm actually starting a new talk show soon, um, that I'm producing and directing. So, and, um, I, uh, well, there, there's a, something I'd like to talk about later, but we can, uh, connect later about that. Uh, it's about, um, basically I, I'd like to get someone to, uh, appear on the show as a Green Party representative, um, to do sort of like an election recap video. Um, so we can talk about like where to go from here. Um, I've already got a couple other panelists from the Madison area, so, but I, I don't wanna to take too much time talking about that, but yeah. Thanks, Eric. We had a few more people join us. Uh, Bruce, uh, if you just wanna let people know who you are and, um, how you serve here with us and a little bit about yourself. Hello, Farland to make it. Um, well, I've been with this party since it formed in Wisconsin. And I'm currently serving on the Morning Council for District 5 and as representative to the National Committee and co-chair on the National Platform Committee. I can make it. Not everybody else could. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so, Bill has uh, let me know that we are past our time for intros on the agenda. Uh, Barb, do you have a count of how many people are left? Um, um, everybody has talked except for Jeff, who had microphone problems. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So, Jeff just sent a, um intro says, I've been with the Greens for the past four years. This is Jeff Reese from Fond du Lac. 
unhappy with the current political system, and I hope that we can reform our elections with RCV, that's ranked choice voting, and getting money out of politics. Cool, thanks, Jeff, and thanks for bearing with us through the technical difficulties. So, um, if there's anyone else who uh, needs to introduce themselves, then please shout out in the chat, and we'll give you a little quick time to introduce yourself. Um, but we should keep moving because we do have a lot uh, to cover today, and we've got some great guests coming up later. I, I'm not even sure if we've announced yet that we, so we had previously announced that um, Howie Hawkins, Angela Walker, and Lisa Savage will be joining us as special guests. And we just confirmed uh, in the past day or so that Sherry Honkala will also be joining us uh, at 2.15. So we now have four uh, awesome guest speakers, um, which is exciting. It also means we have a little less time to get everything else done in, but I'm confident that we can do that. So again, if there's anyone- um, Excuse me, Dave, didn't you also say that Randy Toller or somebody else had a bio in the chat of little introduction in the chat that couldn't get through? Oh, uh, I am not sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. Randy but, Toller. Yes, okay. it's, it's really long. It, it's the longest uh, chat item there is. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll 1022. <laughs> okay, yep. Randy uh, is from Florida as a green co-founder um, and uh, says plan on running for president in 2024 um, and I look forward to meeting you all at the next convention. Well, all right. Welcome Randy from Florida um, and I also saw uh, Looks like Tomas Ward and Ted, did Tomas uh, introduce himself? Yes, he did. Okay, great. And then Ted Savage, do you want to very quickly introduce yourself, say where you're from, and you know, in 30 seconds or less, why uh, you are interested in the Green Party? Uh, sure, I, um, I'm Ted Savage. I'm originally from Illinois, but I moved to Madison after uh, going to school at La Crosse. And, um, after the 2016 election, I got much more involved in politics, and then I uh, was really interested in the Green Party because I really believe in what you guys all stand for. So I am just uh, a newcomer, but I um, am excited to be able to participate and listen. Awesome. Welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's, it's great to have you all here, and nice to see a lot of new people, and, um, you know, just hear a lot of great reasons to be here that uh, I think really resonate with a lot of us. I was like nodding along the entire time. Um, so we have a, um, an agenda that, um, well, I, we had shared the agenda on our website. We now have a you know finalized version of that draft agenda. So if um, someone, uh, one of our officers could share that as a Google Doc just so that people can look at the agenda um, while we're moving through it. That would be great. Uh, so the first item that we have um, is, so the, welcome and introductions. And then uh, as co-chairs, Barb and I will say a few words. Um, so let's get right down to it. and. As Bill said, we're already a little bit behind with the intros. Um, it's a good problem to have because we, we have a lot of people here. Uh, so the let me start with the current political situation. Um, so I'll put it this way. The zombie two-party system is staggering forward. And the neoliberal establishment of the DNC has a serious control o over the Democratic Party and won really a weak, underwhelming victory uh, over the Trump Republicans. And as Joe Biden promises Wall Street donors, nothing will fundamentally change. At least that's what they want. Uh, the Biden transition team 
is full of corporate neoliberals and neoconservatives who will attempt to restore the pre-Trump neoliberal order that led to Trump's rise. Um, and the change that we desperately need will not come from the top and it will not come from the Democratic Party. Uh, the two-party system is the problem, not the solution. And more and more people are realizing that and realizing it's a game of good cop, bad cop, and the people always lose. Um, so the good news is people are ready to leave that system if we give them an alternative. Uh, even in the unprecedented fear and smear campaign that we saw this year, where everything was all about Trump uh, and how terrifying he was, you know, we've been hearing all this talk about, oh, a fascist coup or something like that. Really, you know, the fear levels have been through the roof. Um, and yet a recent poll found that 60% of Americans say that we need a new major party. Um, you know, that's pretty incredible when you look at the manufactured narrative from the corporate media, from the corporate political establishment, that still a landslide majority of people uh, are saying, you know, the system is terrible, these parties are terrible, and we need an alternative. So the Green Party has won over 1,200 elections and is the most successful independent left party since Eugene Debs Socialist Party. Um, and uh, just recently in 2020, you know, as I said, an extremely difficult year for many reasons, uh, the intense propaganda against us as well as the pandemic that made grassroots organizing and, and even signature gathering uh, extremely difficult. Um, and yet we won some important victories. Uh, so we elected a 26 year old green, Emmanuel Estrada as mayor of Baldwin Park, California in East LA County. Um, he beat a 20 year incumbent mayor and um, you know, becomes one of the youngest green mayors yet um, of a city, uh, I think with 75,000 people. So, um, you know, that's the story that you, you never hear in the media is green success in local elections. We've had a lot of it and we need a lot more. Uh, we need to build resistance in both the political and social arena from the bottom up. Uh, and I'm talking about real resistance that won't stop until we get the change we need. Uh, not, you know, controlled resistance and controlled opposition that uh, ends up doing whatever the Democratic Party leadership demands. Um, and this year we got a taste of how far the establishment will go to crush real resistance. Uh, first, they forced us to gather thousands of signatures in the midst of a pandemic with absolutely no concession from the state whatsoever to protect our health or the public's health. Um, you know, they're telling us this is a deadly pandemic. Then they're telling us, Oh yeah, and go out, uh, you know, and go collect thousands of signatures on the street. Um, and then after we turned in twice the necessary number of signatures, Democratic Party operatives invented a false reason to throw out our signatures on a technicality. Um, so we've already covered that story in depth on our website. Uh, but the short version is we were kept off the ballot via the sort of heavy handed authoritarian tactics usually deployed in countries such as Belarus. Um, but the difference is that the U.S. corporate media decries the suppression of political opposition in Belarus, but celebrates the suppression of political opposition in the U.S. Um, and the reason the corporate two-party system and the corporate media suppress Greens uh, is because they know our agenda is popular and it poses a threat to the continued rule of corporations and their agenda of profit over people, planet, and peace. And we have many challenges and many opportunities right now. Uh, we need to keep building the Green Party from the bottom up and build it stronger at every level. That's the local level, state level, the national level, international. But let's start with, <laughs> let's start, uh, with where we are. And we need to break through the media blank out and find ways to be our own media and get our message out. Um, because even when we, when we can get in the media, as I said, it, it's uh, extremely biased against independent politics and against Greens in particular uh, because it's a threat to the corporate message. Uh, so we need to find ways to be our own media and, you know, break through because our message is popular when people actually hear it. Uh, we need to build coalitions with like-minded people and groups 
while constantly advocating the necessity of political independence from the corporate two-party system. Um, and, you know, many of our like-minded groups are, um, you know, going to learn once again that the Democratic Party is not their friend and, you know, that uh, they're not going to get the change they need from the two-party system. Uh, we also need to push for electoral reforms such as ranked choice voting to break the cycle of fear that drives lesser evil voting and keeps most voters stuck in the two-party trap. Um, and I say most voters because uh, a lot of people just don't vote because they're so alienated from the system and they don't see it producing any change in their lives. Uh, but many of those who do vote um, are only voting out of fear. And yeah, so this campaign, you know, Joe Biden ran as not Trump. It, it was totally a fear campaign. It, it, you know, anyone who even suggested that uh, people demand something for their vote were um, intensely attacked. So we know the Democrats won't give us a Green New Deal. Uh, they won't give us Medicare for all. They won't end the wars. They won't give us any of the economic human rights that most other developed countries enjoy, uh, such as childcare, healthcare, um, safety nets, uh, you know, tuition-free public education, and many others. Uh, what they will try to give us is corporate trade deals like the TPP, uh, more war, more corporate welfare, uh, neoliberal austerity, uh, so more cuts for uh, the 99%, more corporate welfare for the 1%. Um, and we're already seeing that uh, if people have been paying attention to Biden's transition team, to his uh, likely cabinet picks. Um, again, it's, uh, you know, the party of war on Wall Street has won again. Uh, so we are almost past the area where everything is about Trump, uh, fortunately, but the system will keep failing the majority of people uh, because Trump was a symptom of a failing, uh, failing system. Uh, he's not the disease, he was the symptom. And we're still facing accelerating climate crisis, rampant inequality and injustice, and the existential threat of a nuclear-armed endless war machine. And the good thing is that the Green Party has the solutions to these problems, and more than ever, Greens see the system for what it is and know what needs to be done. So um, we have a lot of work cut out for us. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us here today, and uh, I really look forward to building the Green Party with you. Um, so I want to hand it over to my co-chair, Barb Dahlgren, um, Barb is ending her term as co-chair today, uh, which is sad for all of us um, because she's done a phenomenal job, uh, but we still have her for the rest of this meeting. So, uh, Barb, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Dave. Um, and I, I want to qualify that with I'm not just going to cut out of the Green Party and say, you know, see you all later. Hope that you do OK without me. <laughs> Um, I am very interested in sticking around and volunteering, helping out in um, really whatever ways that the Wisconsin Green Party need, needs. Um, because I think that this is really the best way to go as a party. I'm really proud to be a Green. Um, we're, the, we're really the only party that doesn't make any shortcuts. We're not getting money from billion, billionaires. We're not going to try and steal elections. We're not doing any of the stuff that the two party system does all the time. We're not vote suppressing people. We're not doing any of that. We want to see the facts um, as they are. We want, we're, we're basically the party of science as well. Um, we're not afraid to know that um, what the truth is in general, if that has to do with climate change um, or anything else that um, if we're wrong, then we move on from that and we make sure that we're consistent with whatever the truth is. Um, so another reason I'm proud of being in the Green Party is that we've always questioned authority. Um, we don't just take for granted what the New York Times says, for example, when they told us that there were uh, weapons of mass destruction so that we had to go to war. 
we question that and we continue to question them. We continue to question all of these authorities that tell us what the reality is and it keeps getting worse and worse and worse where we get these insane lies um, and then we turn into the, the bots and the trolls. They, they start calling us these names. So, you know, I'm proud to be here today as a Russian bot or a troll or whatever they want to call me because I'm here with all of you seeking the truth and seeking what's actually legitimate and correct. Um, and I, I definitely have a few words to say about this summer. Um, the first of which is I want to thank all of you who helped us out with petitioning, um, with call, calling and texting people, with all of the things that you all helped us out um, in order to turn over, over about 4,000 signatures into the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Um, that, was, that was phenomenal. And during a pandemic, and many of you being first time petitioners, uh, I'm a veteran petitioner. I've done it for many seasons and every single time it's tough. It's tough to go up to complete strangers and ask them to support your political party. And so many of you did that for the first time, even as the stakes were raised. Um, and so I really appreciate that from you guys. I really appreciate that so many of you are willing to join us and immediately become leaders. Um, if you recognize, we started by talking about everybody and their interests, not just the co-chairs and, you know, some um, leadership on a pedestal. We don't really have the PR look to us like a, a Democratic or Republican convention might have because we're a legitimate democracy. Everybody legitimately gets their time to speak everybody legitimately gets their vote. It's one person, one vote in the Green Party. Um, and whoever wins is the legitimate victor. That's, that's just the way it is. We use ranked choice voting in many of our processes if we have um, more than two candidates. And, um, and so we really live our values here. We, uh, um, we have created a party that we want to um, experiment in, in the great experiment that we have in the United States, where if we say we want ranked choice voting, we actually test it out here. We make sure that, it, that it's fair and it works. And that's why we have so many people who want to have ranked choice voting around the country is because we've already tested it. We've shown that it works. Um, so those, Dave has said so many great things. I don't want to double um, so many things that he said, especially because we have a lot of business. But I, I do want to, um, to take a second and think about what we experienced this summer. Um, we experienced um, a multi-billion dollar industry in the media and multi-billion dollar campaigns crushing down on us and dragging us through the mud, our little uh, multi-hundred dollar <laughs> Green Party here um, with a completely, for the most part, completely volunteer group of people. Rachel Maddow on MSNBC called us out. The Washington Post owned by the richest man in the world called us out and USA Today um, called us out as well that we were somehow um, being anti-democratic, that we were um, supporting the Republicans. Um, we bothered the billionaires this year to the extent that they had to call us out on national television and in the national press. And if that doesn't tell you that we're actually getting something done, I don't, I don't know what, what will because um, these forces 
have been so powerful in trying to destroy us. And yet, look at all of us here. I can see so many of your smiling faces. And we have not been crushed. Not only that, it actually emboldens us to fight harder. And I don't know about you, but when the Democrats tell me that I don't have a right to exist, that when um, I don't have a right to have my candidates on the ballot, that doesn't really want me to, it doesn't make me want to vote for Democrats. It makes me want to fight harder to get the Greens on the ballot and to get us into those positions. And even with the pandemic, we had many victories in Wisconsin this year. Um, because of our leadership on the Conservation Congress, um, we had three Greens in the Environmental Committee. And because of that, we passed several Environmental Committee rules, um, proposals. And one of those even made it onto the statewide ballot this year which is um, the anti-mining rule, which passed again. Um, this isn't a miraculous feat that Wisconsinites are anti-mining. Uh, everybody knows that. It's passed year after year, but now the, even the leadership can't deny it and they need to let it move forward. Um, we elected Angelito Tenorio in West Dallas as alderman. We also supported some other candidates who, even though they weren't elected, they gathered hundreds and hundreds of people behind them and are still working in the political realm. And they're not stopped by, um, by not winning this time. They have all the support and they're just like a, a, snowball, a snowball gathering more and more snow. Um, their campaigns have not just ceased and, and uh, gone out. They're continuing to grow and they're going to probably run for election again. So even with the, um, with the really sad situation that we have this year with the pandemic, with the um, continuous war and environmental destruction, the things that, um, that make a lot of things seem bleak. Um, I, I'm certainly just emboldened to keep going and do more and grow this party and find the people that are willing to do the work um, like I am. I think that it's just an incredible show of courage to see your faces today. Um, to have you join us today. It was an incredible feat of courage for many of you to, to publicly say that you were voting green. Um, people are often publicly shunned. Um, we often lose friends by telling people that we are gonna vote green. It is a show of courage to let everybody know that you are going to exist and you're just going to stand there and exist when the powers that be don't want that existence at all. So the first step is showing that we exist. And I think that we have proven that over again, year after year, that we are here. We're here in Wisconsin. We're here in the United States. Um, Greens around the world know that we're here too, which is great. And we're gonna keep moving forward because we don't really have much other choice than to survive and to thrive. Um, so I look forward to thriving with you in the next year. And I, I really hope to see you all on committees, on the coordinating council and um, as volunteers. So thank you all for joining us and um, Let's get this started. Thanks, Barb. Yeah, um, and thanks for all your work over the past two years. Uh, you know, we couldn't have done it without you. And, um, you know, your work on the petition drive was nothing less than heroic. 
Um, so uh, we, at this point, um, we are a little behind on our business agenda, but I'm confident that we can move through it quickly. Uh, but why don't we take a, um, you know, do people want to take a two minute break just to, um, you know, run to the bathroom or, you know, get up and stretch for a couple minutes? Uh, can we see in the chat, uh, you know, reactions to that? Two minute break sound good. Do we need a little bit longer? Um, okay. Uh, yes, yes, three minutes, two minutes, good. All right, let's just say three minutes and not argue about it. So um, folks can come back by 11.03 and we'll get started on the uh, you know, officer committee chapter reports and we'll try to go through those quickly so we can get to our other business. All right, see you at 11.03. All right, so it's 11.03, so let's get started with the Finance Committee report. Um, yeah, so uh, Bill and Patty, do you want to uh, present the Finance Committee report? Can someone share a uh, screen share the uh, one-page financial report, as I have previously requested? I don't have the um, <clears throat> skill set to do that. Then people I could probably do along. that. Yeah, I got it. So, um, okay. All right. Are you seeing it? Okay. So, do I have everyone's attention? Are we back and ready to go? Yes. Did I just proceed? Okay. The Wisconsin Green Party has two financial officers, an operations treasurer and an elections treasurer. I have served as the operations treasurer for the last year, Patty Ashby as the elections treasurer. We prepared this financial performance report, which was reviewed and approved by the Wisconsin Green Party Coordinating Council at its most recent meeting on November 11th. This report will cover the period since our last statewide membership meeting, our spring gathering, which took place in April. We have two bank accounts, checking and savings. 
Let's start with checking. On April the 1st of this year, we had a balance of $1,569. I'd like to draw your attention to the income column below. First thing to note is that virtually all of the Wisconsin Green Party's income consists of dues and donations, primarily dues. We are a membership organization. We are funded entirely by our members and supporters. And our members do pay dues. Nearly two thousand, the, the nearly $2,000 under income for April is dues money, almost it's in its entirety. Um, people joined or renewed and paid their annual dues during or following that well-attended spring conference and nominating convention. And that really made all the difference in the world for us. Except for some fundraising income in July related to petitioning, all of the rest of the money in the income column consists of dues payments. A big thank you to all who have paid dues and have stayed current with dues. And by the way, you can pay your dues by check uh, sent to our post office box or better yet online at our website. Now to expenses. We spent money on only four things since our last state meeting. That is four broad categories. First is nation builder. This is our online server we rely on for virtually everything related to membership, dues, recruitment, donations, volunteers, communications. There is an annual fee, in this case, $1,142. Second, petitioning. Our total expense for petitioning uh, for this summer was $1,148. Then there's postage and printing, uh, which for these months ran to $230 and then $25 for bank fees, fees. Our ending balance for checking was $2,484, meaning we had a net gain of over $900 for this period, thanks to the conscientious commitment of our members. Um, this will well position us for the campaigns we have coming up as soon as next spring. Now, in addition to checking, we have a reserve fund of a little over $12,000. We've had to tap into that fund in the past, but not this year. So the balance is now $12,180, giving us a total of $14,665.17 in assets, checkings, and savings combined as of October the 1st, 2020. Thank you, and I will take questions if there are any. Pass. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, I'm wondering if we can put questions into the chat uh, so that we can keep moving with our committee reports and, you know, then Bill and Patty can just uh, see if there are any questions in the chat and try to answer them there. It would be great. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Um, great report. And so next up, uh, we have the membership committee. Patty? Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, it's, it's truly inspiring to see so many here today. Um, I introduced myself earlier. Um, I'm Patty Ashby, and I'm the chair of the Wisconsin Green Party Membership Outreach Committee. Um, our committee meets on the first Thursday every month through Google Hangouts. And our primary focus is to grow the Green Party in Wisconsin through membership campaigns, outreach, and organizing events like this one. The last six months have been busy for the committee, starting with organizing the spring gathering, 
which initially was set to be held as an in-person event in Madison, but because of COVID-19 was delivered virtually through Zoom on April 18th. And many of you here today attended the event, which was a tremendous success and resulted in an impressive number of new members joining and also former members renewing their Green Party, Wisconsin Green Party membership. Another success has been Barbara Dahlgren's Green Socials, which she's been hosting online weekly on Mondays at 530. And the socials are great because they offer an opportunity for Greens and anyone interested in engaging with the Green Party to connect and chat informally, not only about Green Party issues, but whatever else is on your mind, such as gardening, books, and so on. And um, you'll find information about the social, um, the Green Socials on our Wisconsin Green Party website, or sorry, uh, Facebook page. Um, Currently, our annual um, membership renewal campaign is underway. Um, the Wisconsin Green Party does need your support, not only financially, but also, also through volunteerism. We've all just said earlier, we agree that the corporate two-party system keeps failing us. So it is apparent and essential that we invest more time and energy in growing the Green Party in Wisconsin and across the United States. The membership committee is tasked with growing the party from the bottom up. And to do this, we need passionate volunteers who not only represent the Green Party as visible activists, but also behind the scenes where the groundwork for growth is being laid. What is our strategy for growth? In 2021, we hope to establish more local chapters. So there are Green Party members working on the ground across the state, attending and organizing events in their area. If you are interested in starting a chapter, um, please do contact me and the Membership Outreach Committee will help you with launching it and ensuring its success. With our outreach hats on, we'll continue our work to grow the Green Party through direct interaction with those who reach out to us, expressing an interest in connecting and learning more about our mission and platform. New interest in the Green Party is always robust. So if you have even just a few extra minutes each week to email or call a few people who might become members, you can have a valuable impact on growing the party. Or if you are one who's more comfortable with behind the scenes work, we always need volunteers to help maintain and update our member database. And lastly, as um, Barbara, has said because the Green Party does not accept corporate donations and we rely solely on contributions and membership dues for our revenue to grow, we need current members to renew your membership. And if you're new to the Green Party, I hope today's event will inspire you to become a member and hopefully volunteer as well. And I just wanna say thank you and welcome <clears throat> to those who have joined just recently in the last few weeks, bravo for you. Um, you can renew or become a member today on the Wisconsin Green Party website on the contribute page. Um, I'm going to put my contact information in the chat now. So. Don't hesitate to um, call me or email me if you have any questions. Um, I'd love to chat with you and um, see where we can fit you in so you can help the, the, the Green Party grow in Wisconsin. Thanks everybody so much and um, enjoy the day. Thanks, Patty. And thanks for all your great work. Um, yeah, so next up, oh, and let's, Let's continue to um, put questions uh, in the chat for, related to our reports. Um, you know, we're having some good conversation there. And since we're a little behind on time already, uh, I think that is the best way to proceed. Um, so the next report that we have up is the Elections Committee. Uh, Barb? Hi again, everyone. 
Um, I currently serve as the elections committee chair. Um, the elections committee is responsible for seeking out candidates and um, working on endorsing candidates. We have a questionnaire that every candidate needs to fill out before we even discuss them. Um, and then we make our recommendation for an endorsement and the, um, the coordinating council actually does the endorsement. So that's pretty much the bulk of the work that we do, but also when we had to petition, pretty much any time we have to petition, we help to organize petitioning drives. We work closely with candidates um, who we've endorsed to help with their petitioning and campaigning efforts. Um, we have a lot of people going door to door with literature um, on a usual year. This year has been um, less of that. And, and clearly we've had a lot of additional struggles this year um, trying to fulfill what is usually um, a fairly reasonable petitioning schedule in Wisconsin. Um, and I say that because I came from Illinois, for those of you who don't know, I've, I've been living here as a transplant for like 12 years now. But when I started petitioning in Illinois and we had to collect almost 50,000 signatures to get anybody on the statewide ballot, um, two to 4,000 doesn't seem like much, but even in, <laughs> but since it's been a pandemic year, um, that has definitely complicated things as well. We did not get the petitioning relief that Illinois did on any level. So um, it was very tough to work on uh, getting people on the ballot this year. And even when we did everything that we were supposed to, um, and, and I'm talking especially with the presidential race, um, whenever we had difficulties, we knew that, for example, that Angela Walker had moved in the middle of um, petitioning, which is not illegal, by the way, as, as far as I, I remember, moving is still legal in the United States. Um, but even though we contacted the WEC right away and um, followed their, um, their recommendation to the letter, we still got challenged and the highly partisan um, WEC decided that even though all of our signatures were, um, were stellar, that they couldn't find anything wrong with the signatures themselves, that um, they would vote three to three to keep us off the ballot. So um, that's how we ended up in the Supreme Court this year. Um, and if there's any more questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk more with um, any of you later. It's definitely been a huge um, effort this year. And just a little bit about um, petitioning. We had over 70 volunteers help us with petitioning and um, calling and text banking to get out the, the, the signatures from people's personal homes. So uh, some other parties might have sent out petitions to every single person. We didn't really have the capability to do that. So we did, we called a lot of our membership and asked them, would you be able to print out the petition? And 65 of you responded um, to those calls and even more of you actually sent in petitions to us. So we really appreciate all of that hard work this summer. Um, we also had a bunch of candidates this year. Um, and I, I should let you know a little bit about the elections um, committee here. We meet the first Tuesdays of the month. Of course, the new elections committee can always change that for the next year. Um, we have had several people serving on the committee, including myself, Barb Eisenberg, Tom Rodman, uh, Adam Kosalki was serving earlier this year, Mike McAllister, um, Dave Schwab, um, Dennis Boyer, and uh, hopefully I got everybody. Um, and the candidates that we worked with this year pretty closely were Alex Brower in Milwaukee for city comptroller, 
Um, and he has already asked for our endorsement for his next campaign, um, which has already begun for, um, for school board. Uh, we're, so we're in the process of that endorsement as well. Um, for those of you who are interested in running for 2021 races, um, school board is one of the, the biggest ones across the state. So if you are interested in running for school board, um, you can definitely reach out and contact me. Um, we also worked with Angelito Tenorio in District 1 um, for the aldermanic seat here in West Dallas. Um, and he, he won his seat. We also endorsed um, Cassandra Erickson in Brown County for the Brown County Board. And um, she won her seat. And um, besides that, we, we also endorsed uh, Adam Kosalki for Greenfield School Board, um, Jeff Jacobs for 56th District um, uh, Assembly Person. And I think that's it. And we, we also have 12 elected officials um, that are currently holding office across the state of Wisconsin. So we are working to increase that in the, the next couple of years. We're definitely seeking candidates for statewide offices in 2022. Those are really important races coming up and it's, it's um, important to start thinking about those um, now. But also in 2021, we have school board races every year. We have smaller local races that people will have the opportunity to run for. So um, in service of getting people prepared to run for office and to help volunteer, um, we will be doing, this is our big announcement, that we'll be doing a campaign school this year on December 19th on Zoom. Um, and so we've done these the last couple of years in person and um, we've just had a lot of great people thinking about running for office come over and many of them have actually decided to run. Um, so they've always been a great resource for people um, and very inspiring because often we have elected officials who have already done the whole process come and join us for those as well. So um, I think that's pretty much all I have. If you have any questions for me, um, just put them in the chat. I would uh, love to hear from any of you about joining the elections committee or volunteering with us. Um, the elections committee is what makes this a political party. The fact that we not only have some political ideas that we support, but that we really put people behind those or in front of those ideas and run for those offices. Um, something that I've been pretty passionate about throughout my time here is to start running more people for the Conservation Congress, which there are positions that come up every single year in every county. And it's such a small, um, the, the stakes are so small, you don't need to really campaign for it because it's literally um, on, on the day of you, you can run for that office. Um, and there are not very many people who attend these meetings. Uh, I'm elected to the Conservation Congress now, and we have one other, no, we have two other people elected to the Conservation Congress across the state. But these are really seats that could go green very quickly. Um, and so I, I look forward to helping flip the whole state green in the next year or two. Um, so I look forward to hearing from you and let's keep moving on. Thanks, Barb. Great work as always. Um, all right, so next we have the IT committee. Tom, if you could give us a quick IT report, uh, some of the major developments. Okay, <clears throat> I'm looking at the clock. I'll try to make this maybe three minutes. Um, Great. I'm not organized as usual. Uh, so I guess in terms of help, like we're always looking for volunteers. And 
So we don't really have like somebody that's qualified as a database administrator that knows SQL and that, that sort of thing. That would be a nice to have thing. Uh, we need somebody who has good video editing experience. Um, we need people like me, I think I have kind of a system admin view. Um, uh, we uh, we need both like software developers and system admin types and um but any kind of help is great so so what is the it side i've been trying to kind of architect this so that if i got hit by a bus that i've trained enough people like for example in this meeting there's i tried to get backups for myself but that's difficult though uh and we still have some vulnerabilities where uh, we need to do more cross training but in that like my philosophy is to um, set up ownership by the green party as to to like having one key person that owns everything and then when they're gone we're in trouble um, so for example our domain we um, we're getting that cleared up uh, in terms of having the party actually renew the domain and the DNS and so forth. Um, okay, 11.24, I'm at two minutes. All right, so I'll try to stay high level here. Um, what do we do? What do I do? I support uh, email campaigns, kind of like MailChimp, but we're using Nation Builder, so we do a lot of that. Um, Dave, Dave's probably the most experienced in that. IT overlaps into everything. So all the different groups I'm involved in and IT's involved in. So we, um, uh, so again, outreach. So encourage and try to train people. Another thing I do is just train people on basic computer skills so they can get up to speed and do texting, calling and emailing outreach to new people that are hitting the website. Um, we're trying to organize all our documents, moving them off of an old style wiki onto Google Drive and having a sensible architecture on Google Drive. We're always looking at new tools. We, I'm biased towards free Libre open source software. And now I'm at about three minutes. So um, just the more the merrier we have, I have monthly meetings and unfortunately I, we don't have as many people as, as I would like, but you know, Monty's helping out, Tomas is helping out, Mike McAllister helps, Greg Banks, uh, Barb. Uh, I appreciate all the, the help that I've had so far. Thanks, Pass. Um, how can people join or get a hold of you to join the committee? Uh, sure, so, um, well, my last name's Rodman. Uh, you can find me, I have a, a, a trodman.com there's also um mailing list why don't i put my my contact info in the chat um for for that phone number too. yeah that'd be great and also i was just about to uh make a call for you know if, if people are interested in joining any of our committees uh we would really love to have more volunteers and um so I will just put in the chat, um, you can volunteer for committees. And so uh, this WisconsinGreenParty.org slash committees, it has more information about uh, our state committees. So you can have a look at sort of what the responsibilities are. And, um, you know, that is where the work gets done for our state party. So we would love to have uh, more help and people bring their, you know, experience and skills uh, to those committees. Um, even if you don't have a lot of experience, uh, you know, as people mentioned, we do a lot of training as well. Um, and so our uh, committees include uh, the membership outreach committee, uh, which Patty talked about, the elections committee, which Barb talked about, finance committee, as Bill talked about, um, then the communications committee has been less active, but um, that is responsible for things like uh, emails, social media, uh, newsletters, uh, website, print materials, merch, um, and uh, we 
would love to have more help with the communications committee and get that more active. Uh, same with the platform and policy committee, and that works on updating our platform uh, as well as drafting uh, policies and statements on, on current issues for the party. Uh, so we would love to have more help there and get that committee more active. Then there's the IT uh, committee, information technology, that Tom was just talking about. Um, and also, our newest committee is not yet on this page, but it's the dispute resolution committee. Um, so if people have experience or interest in the area of dispute resolution, um, then we could uh, use your help there. So yeah, please just go to that website, um, wisconsingreenpride.org slash committees, and uh, you can indicate your interest in any of them and um, you know, write a little bit about why you think you're a good fit um, and what you would bring to the committee. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, then feel free to, to reach out and ask. Um, but yeah, all, you know, all of our committees um, could use more help. Uh, so thanks everyone for those presentations. Why don't we jump to the national committee? Uh, do I get to say anything about platform? Uh, yes, you you sure can. If you know if there's anything to report. Okay, um, platform committee. I'll talk a little bit about the state and national levels. The state committee. Uh, we've had trouble trying to keep a committee together. Now we have three or four people. We meet on the third Wednesday of the month, so we have a meeting coming up soon. Uh, platform is an extremely important part of our party. Many, many of the people who come to our party do so after they stumble upon either the national or the state platform. Both are fairly comp comprehensive, but they're both living documents. They need to change because the platform is where we draw our policies from. And these are the things that people run on. I mean, it, it'd be nice to run just on our values and things because we are a value-based party, but people want to know what's going to happen when we get into office. So that's the purpose of both the national and the state platform committees. Currently, I've been looking ahead to the next statewide election where we need to get somebody elected to one of the state uh, constitutional parties, which is governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, or treasurer. That's usually how we get our ballot access, usually through the state secretary or state treasurer. We need to have that because next the presidential election, we don't want the Democrats messing around with us and they won't if we already have ballot access. So it's very important in 2022 that we get somebody, either treasurer or secretary or even a governor candidate that can get like 1% of the vote, which is not a very high threshold. But we need to be prepared, prepared for that for our candidates. So we need to know that our policies, platform planks are up to date. So I'd urge people to join the platform committee and look at uh, their platform, not very long, about five pages, but we haven't made many changes to it in recent years. But, so our platform needs to be up to date. To that end, I put together a two page summary of our platform, about, only about 26 items and with a further goal of trying to narrow it down to like five key points. Because when you run a campaign, you want to get keep things simple. So you want to address, like you think, the five, even the three best possible policy things that you could run on. I'm not going to do that myself because I'm just one person. So I put together this list and I'd like some feedback on it. What people think about the items that are there, what are the most important ones, or what might be missing. So. Uh, you can contact me directly. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that comes in backwards. I'll put my, my thing on uh, the chat about that, and I'll send it to you, and hopefully I'll get some feedback. But I also hope that people will join the committee, not only to work on the platform, but we also need an active committee that can deal with policies. I mean, because things are changing all the time, and we need to be ready to address them. Uh, this would be a great benefit to our spokespeople, our co-chairs at the state level, 
if they have some people looking, researching things be, uh, for them. On top of that, the National Committee, uh, which I'm also co-chair of, our next uh, session of, for accepting new platform amendments begins on April 1st, 2021, next year, for a six month period. Uh, again, it's a living document. It's 80 some pages long. I encourage you to read it. Uh, and again, it's a source of many of the members of the National Committee that we get, not no, National Committee, but the National Green Party is, is an inspiration to a lot of people. Uh, and I know it's not completely up to date either. There's, there's always things that need to be added or adjusted or reworded at the national level as well as the state level. And the amendments for the national party come from each state party. So they have to start here. So we need, if there's something in the national platform that needs to change <clears throat> or upgraded, um, that needs to start here in Wisconsin. So that's another reason to have a good platform committee here in the state so we can address the issues in the national platform, which again is important to our national candidates, especially the, the presidential candidates. So I'll po post my uh, contact information in the chat and uh, hope to see a few new faces on Wednesday. And Tom will probably be putting that out. Uh, we do a, a, a video meeting and I assume he'll be putting out info on that soon. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Um, do you have a, a very quick national committee report for us too? Okay, the National Committee hasn't been uh, all that active lately because of the elections. Nothing really to vote on or discuss. Although there's a, there's a discussion list where people talk a lot about current events. And, uh, but the actual voting list where people discuss actual proposals, the National Committee has been fairly inactive for the last couple of months because of the election. Uh, the current most important issue right now before the National Committee is our annual budget for 2021. Uh, it doesn't look like our funds are going to go up very much. And uh, we have a total uh, employment of three full-time equivalent people, which um, is peanuts compared to even local organizations. So we really at the national level don't have a lot of funds. So if you can afford to contribute to the state party, also consider uh, donating to the national party. But there's another issue in regard to that is we are a membership based state party. People become members because they pay dues. There is a sizable number of other state parties that think that the national party should be the same. And I have considered for some time, that, some time that Wisconsin should perhaps put together a proposal to, to make the switch. There would be a lot of, of resistance to it because some, because some state parties have state registration where you register in California or Delaware or anything as a member of the party. And then by our rules, the national level, you are a member of the national party as well. And proportionally uh, delegates to the national committee are, are based on uh, those uh, party registrations, which is kind of unfair to states like Wisconsin that don't have party registration. But the more important thing is that the, the national party is basically broke. It has been for years. And until we can get a base of, of people at least contributing some kind of minimal $5 a year membership and plus their contact information, which is probably just as important. Uh, we're never gonna have a floor, a budget floor that we know that we can count on every year. So I think it's an important uh, principle. And I think the Wisconsin Green Party should at least present a proposal and get people talking about it. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Um, 
Cool. So I think that that brings us to the end of our committee reports. And um, so next up, let's have some very uh, quick local reports. Um, I know we have two uh, local chapters that um, we can hear reports from, and then we can move on to announcements. So I'll just start with the Four Lakes Green Party, um, which is the local for Dane County in South Central Wisconsin. Um, so uh, we have had a, an interesting year. Um, I, I, one of our main focuses this year has been on racial justice, uh, you know, supporting the George Floyd uprising and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, in uh, you know, locally there have been a lot of different flashpoints around this, such as police officers in schools, which the uh, uh, the Madison School Board voted to remove um, this year, which is you know a significant step forward. Um, however, we also are facing a uh, a very bad project to try to spend um, around 150 million dollars on a shiny new jail in Dane County. Um, so that's a huge expense to expand our capacity for mass incarceration, uh, and there are many misguided things about this uh, project, which is, you know, supported by the liberal Democrats um, who run Madison, but there is, you know, very significant progressive grassroots opposition to the jail project, um, you know, as the, uh, the most segregated city in the most segregated state, you know, with, with the greatest disparities, um, and that is not only for the African American population, but also the uh, the Native American population, um, you know, we have uh, so much work to do. And, you know, unfortunately, the, uh, the people who want to close their eyes and pretend that Madison is some liberal utopia um, are, you know, actively trying to perpetuate the cycle of injustice. So uh, that's been a big issue. Another big issue has been the F-35s, um, you know, again, uh, there is, ex you know, extremely um, active opposition uh, from, you know, a broad coalition of groups against bringing F-35 fighter jets to Madison um, and, you know, treating our city as a uh, military base and a dumping ground for, uh, you know, toxic uh, industrial wastes, uh, specifically PFAS. Um, and yet the Democratic power establishment has, uh, has pushed this through, um, you know, with Tammy Baldwin in the lead um, and, you know, acting like, uh, you know, bringing uh, multi-billion dollar fighter jets, uh, you know, to a base in the middle of a thriving city um, is some sort of jobs program. I mean, it's, it's uh, perfectly encapsulates, I think, everything that we were talking about before in this really diseased uh, system where we're governed by two parties of war and Wall Street. Um, anyway, I could go off on that, uh, but unfortunately, the you know the decision was taken to try to base the F-35s here, but the opposition and resistance continues. Um, so, uh, you know, as with many things, and we are looking at uh, city council elections coming up in the spring. We're looking at um, at least a couple of county board seats that are open, um, you know, there has been tremendous grassroots activity uh, in Madison, Dane County area this year. Uh, so we are hoping to, you know, continue building coalitions with those groups um, and others and, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, take this from a one party town uh, and, you know, bring in an actual progressive party. Um, so I will uh, pass with that and uh, I'm not sure who's giving the Greater Milwaukee chapter report. Um, who would, yeah. That would be me. Oh, Mike, okay. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we do uh, in, in the Greater Milwaukee Greens is at the beginning of the year, we set ourselves uh, a, a, a series of long-term goals 
uh, which uh, are intended to guide our work for the for the coming year. And uh, back in uh, uh, the early part of 2020, we we set four uh, long term goals to to increase the number of candidates we endorsed above uh, over the number that we uh, uh, were campaigns we were involved with in 2019 uh, to double our uh, paid membership through bottoms up grassroots organizing, uh, have at least three social events in the course of the year, and to organize a coalition and a campaign for a local Green New Deal. Uh, we met our candidate goal, and as Bar Barbara mentioned uh, last spring, we helped elect Angelito Tenorio to the West Dallas City Council. Uh, we have been growing our membership by reaching out uh, members. Uh, our members have also been participating in the 100 plus days of Black Lives Matter marches and rallies in and around the city of Milwaukee. Uh, we are involved in the movement to seek justice for, for the three young men shot and killed by Wauwatosa police officer Joseph Mensa in the last two year in, in the last two years and for Jacob Blake, uh, Joel Acevedo, and Dontre Hamilton and the countless other victims of police violence across the country. Uh, we worked hard to put Holly Hawkins and Angela Walker on the ballot. I don't have to talk about that anymore. <laughs> uh, while a pandemic has made it difficult to gather for festivities in real life, uh, uh, we've already talked about the hangout, so I'll cut this short and at our next meeting next Saturday, uh, we will begin to discuss the possibilities for a Green New Deal campaign in Milwaukee. Uh, if you're in Greater Milwaukee and you haven't reached out to, haven't uh, been yet, uh, we meet on the second Saturday of every month, uh, except when there's a state gathering. So we will be meeting next Saturday uh, at 10.30, starting at 10.30 in the morning, our, our meetings don't, uh, go ju for just two hours. Uh, and they cr we currently use this very same Zoom platform uh, until uh, life, uh, until the libraries start uh, letting us meet in their meeting rooms again. Uh, watch Facebook and the Greater Milwaukee Green Party discussion list for details if you want to know more about those uh, are our social media uh, activities. Uh, you can write me at workingwriter at prodigy.net. I'll put that in the chat. Uh, we're also looking for uh, a couple of uh, uh, volunteers to uh, 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 handle outreach to the media and writing press releases and all that kind of stuff, and a social media coordinator. Uh, who can help out with the website and, uh, and website, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and all the other presences we have. Uh, so uh, we will begin to work on uh, new long-term goals in December. And in January, we, have, we will have uh, officer elections. Uh, there will be two open seats for co-chairs next year. Uh, and uh, folks, uh, folks, uh, we encourage people to think about those. Uh, I can tell people about how things are going to go forward. Uh, that's all I got. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, okay, great. So I believe that takes us to the end of our reports and. Um, we are still a little bit behind on time, so uh, you know any questions or discussion, let's have in the chat. Um, now we want to make some announcements, and then we will take a break and um, you know head to a slightly more participatory uh, part of the meeting, where uh, we will have. A hearing and discussion of bylaws changes proposals and then we will um, do our internal elections uh, at least we will the nomination and uh, speeches and discussion part um, so more on that in just a second uh, so first I wanted to make some announcements um, 
and I'm sure Barb and other officers will chime in if I miss anything. <laughs> uh, so first of all, uh, we use Stack and uh, how that works in Zoom. <laughs> if you would like to speak, then um, write Stack in the chat and you'll be added to the Stack. Um, and you know we allow people to speak in the order that they get on the stack. Um, and uh, you know the only exception would be if a question is asked and you have the you know immediate answer to that question, you know such as factual information, um, and, you know then you can say direct response and. Uh, you know, that way we don't have to wait a long time before getting the answer to some, you know, important information for our decision making. Or another thing is you can put the answer directly into the chat and that saves even more time. Um, but direct response is not because, oh, I want to, you know, respond to that point immediately. So I want to jump the stack. Uh, please don't use direct response for that. Uh, we use stack so that everyone can, you know, speak in the order that they raise their hand basically. And the other exception is that we try to use what we call progressive stack, which means that we um, you know, try to hear different voices. And um, you know, for example, if there are people who haven't yet spoken, we might go to them first before someone who has already uh, you know, spoken before. Um, so uh, next up, a note about membership. So. Uh, as mentioned before, we, we're a dues-paying membership party. Um, you know, everyone is welcome to join our meetings as an observer. If you'd like to participate in the discussion and decision making, uh, then you should be a member in good standing. And what that means is that you are up on your annual dues. Um, so if you have uh, donated or paid dues uh, within the last year, um, then you should be a member in good standing. And you'll be eligible to, uh, you know, participate in the decision making, and you'll get a ballot to vote, um, you know, by the end of today's meeting. Uh, if you are not yet a uh, member, uh, or you need to renew your membership, uh, please do that now, and you know that way we can make sure that uh, you know everyone is up on their dues, and you know as Bill and Bruce and others mentioned. That's how we uh, sustain our party. That's how we're able to uh, do what we do as a non-corporate party with no, uh, you know, no sponsorship from the corporate elite. We're funded by, uh, you know, regular people, just like the ones in this meeting. Um, and another quick note is, uh, you know, as, as Bruce mentioned, we can use more. Uh, more donors and more sustainers for the National Green Party. Uh, I'm a sustaining monthly member of both the Wisconsin Green Party and the National Green Party, and I encourage uh, other people to do the same because uh, we need more resources. But you know, we're punching above our weight at at all levels, uh, and we accomplish a you know a lot given that uh, our budget has been so small, and we could accomplish more with more. Um, so. Uh, all right, next about the, oh, and if someone could share the uh, contribute link. Um, and I should also mention that it's a suggested sliding scale. So uh, if you look at the different levels on the contribute page and, you know, please make an honest assessment of what you can afford to contribute. Um, so, uh, there's a question about, is there a waiver process? Yes, if you um, can't, you know, if you really can't afford to give anything, you can request a waiver, uh, you know, that has to be approved by the coordinating council. Um, you know, there is a low income uh, or a financial hardship or student membership, which is $12 a year or $1 a month. Um, so, um, you know, most people should be able to afford that. Uh, if you really can't, then you can request a waiver. Um, but again, you know, nobody's funding our party but ourselves. So please, uh, you know, do what you can. 
Um, and many people do the individual membership level and, and many people do higher level. So, so thanks to everyone who's contributing with your membership dues. Uh, so regarding decision making, so um, we won't be really uh, making decisions on any proposals today. We'll, we'll have discussion of some bylaws changes. Um, you know, typically we try to make decisions by consensus. If we don't have consensus, then uh, we can bring things to a vote and uh, we can pass proposals with 60% uh, of people voting yes. Um, but that, like I said, isn't as relevant today. What's more relevant is our election process. So we use um, ranked choice voting uh, for uh, candidates, including for internal elections. Um, so for single winner elections, um, it, you know, it would work pretty simply. Uh, the person with the most, or you know, if someone gets a majority, then they're elected. If no one gets a majority, then the you know, last place finisher is eliminated and their votes are reallocated, those ballots are reallocated to second choice and so on and so forth until someone has a majority. Um, I think a lot of us are familiar with ranked choice voting, but if you're not, then um, I'm sure that people can share resources in the, uh, in the chat um, so you can learn, it's pretty quick. Uh, we also use ranked choice voting for multiple winner elections, um, which is also known as single transferable vote. And what that means is that once candidates reach a certain threshold of votes, then they would win a seat. Uh, this is, for example, how we allocated our four delegates in the presidential nominating uh, process earlier this year. Um, you know, we were able to allocate those de delegates proportionally, but it works the same. You um, you rank your the candidates in the order that you prefer them. Uh, you your favorite candidate first, second favorite second, and so on and so forth. Um, there also is the option to vote uh, for none of the below. And what that means in this context is that if, um, you know, you may not like any of the candidates and so you would just put your first rank as none of the below. Or you may like some of them, but not all of them. So you might rank your your first candidate first, your second candidate third, but then you would rather not um, elect any of the other candidates. So, uh, excuse for, me, Dave. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We were working on designing this last night, um, and uh, we consensed on um, this enhanced rank choice where you simply remove the people that you don't want on the ballot. At least that's the intention. Uh, Actually, you just don't add them. You get a list of people. You can put them on, in, in a new order. You put them on on your ballot. Is your uh, rank? Uh, yeah. Sorry to get into all the detail, but uh, maybe we'll follow up with an explanation um, at the top of the ballot pass. Okay. Yeah, that would be helpful because um, you know in our bylaws. This is referred to as none of the above voting. Um, yeah, so that is that's an option, you know, always when when we vote. So as long as there is a way to, uh, you know, indicate that, you know, only I only want to vote for these candidates and I don't want to vote for the other candidates, um, then that should work. Um, all right, so I know people might be a little confused by that, so it sounds like Tom is going to uh, explain that once our ballots are ready. Um, so then finally, we will be voting on um, congressional district representatives to our coordinating council. So the, the coordinating council is our decision-making body. Um, it meets once a month. Um, or sometimes on special occasions uh, to you know make important decisions for the Wisconsin Green Party, and all of our officers are all of our state officers are members of the coordinating council, and we also have um, 
one representative from each congressional district, um, and, of which there are eight. Uh, we have up to eight at-large representatives, and we also have um, uh, each accredited local chapter is entitled to elect one representative. Um, so um, today will be, or the ballots that we'll send out today will include the officer elections for co-chair, uh, the two treasurer positions and the two secretary positions. Uh, it will include the um, uh, at-large coordinating council positions and that will be a multi-seat election uh, conducted using ranked choice voting as we just discussed. And then uh, each congressional district will have a congressional district representative election. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, Sam, if you're in CD4, then you'll be voting on the CD4 rep. So that will be a single winner election conducted using ranked choice voting but only people within that congressional district um, are eligible to vote on that one. Uh, the, the local chapters will elect their, uh, their local chapter representative um, in the near future, so that won't happen today. Uh, we'll also elect uh, national committee delegates to the Green Party U.S. National Committee and national committee alternates to the Green Party U.S. National Committee. Um, so that is the extent of today's elections. And the one other thing that I wanted to say is that we are um, very much looking to uh, start chapters in every congressional district um, across the state. You know, we have uh, eight congressional districts and um, you know, we currently have active local chapters in three of them. Uh, we'd like to expand to all eight. So. Um, if you would like to run for congressional district representative to the coordinating council, um, then please think of it as an organizing position where, uh, in addition to being on the coordinating council, you'll also be uh, involved with organizing a chapter within your congressional district. Um, and, you know, we can work with you on making that happen. Uh, so anyway, that brings me to the end of my announcements. Um, Barb, do you have any others to add? I guess um, just a few. First of all, uh, we are going to continue um, Green Socials on Mondays at 530 um, until further notice. So um, we hope to see you on Mondays. Also, we have all kinds of merchandise. It's not really advertised online because we, um, we don't usually like ship things out to people, but it's not an impossibility if you are not around the area where we have these objects and you would like them. Um, you would have to pay shipping if you want to to get them in your area, but we do have t-shirts like the one that I've got here. So you can get a stylish green party t-shirt. Um, we have all kinds of buttons that have a similar look to them. And if you are in the greater Milwaukee area, you can get um, buttons and things like that as well. Um, and also literature. And we do have some printable literature on the website too. Um, these objects are and, and more are usually created by the communications committee or decided on by the communications committee. Um, sometimes also with the help of the membership committee. So if you'd like to help design these things, um, that's a good area to work on. And I always have to mention it because we still haven't finished out um, this contest that has been, um, we've been talking about doing for I don't know, almost two years now, and we haven't actually gone through with it, is that um, we had a proposal to create a mascot for the Green Party, um, a turtle mascot, because we are uh, slow and steady, but we will eventually win in the end. 
They're a very green animal um, and they're just a legacy. Um, they've got a long legacy of representing um, ecological wisdom and, and a, a good environment. So if you'd like to help out with creating um, a turtle mascot um, and join the contest, uh, you can definitely email that to me. I'll put my email in the chat and we will have all of our um, submissions up on the website soon. If um, we could get some help with that as well, that would be great. Um, and I think that's it for now. Okay, great. Uh, do any of our other officers have uh, any announcements to add? Okay, not hearing any. And um, I'll just add that, you know, we will still be accepting self nominations from the floor uh, before we start our elections. So um, we'll share a list of the open positions and, you know, candidates who've already thrown their hat in the ring. And, uh, you know, if folks want to self nominate from the floor before we get started, um, then you'll have an opportunity to do that. Uh, but for right now, let's take another uh, short break and then um, we'll come back and uh, start our discussion on the proposed bylaws changes. Um, and then we have a break scheduled for 12.30 to one for lunch break. Um, so it's looking like the elections will probably mostly happen uh, or maybe entirely happen after the lunch break starting at one. Um, so, um, yeah, let's take that quick break right now. Uh, let's do another, you know, four minute break. And if people can come back at 1210, uh, and then we can try to get through the, this bylaws discussion real quick and then we can get some lunch. All right. Thanks you all. See you at 1210.
All right, so it's now 1210. Uh, so uh, one of the pieces of business we have today is discussion of a couple of proposed bylaws changes. So you can find this um, under the meeting agenda on our website. Um, and this is kind of the most in the weeds that we will get in this meeting. So bear with us, uh, try to make it as quick and painless as possible. So our, our process as set out in our bylaws is that if we want to propose changes, then first we bring it to one state meeting for discussion, and then uh, we bring it to the next meeting for decision. Uh, so right now, this is up for discussion. Um, and um, yeah, there are two uh, proposed changes. So the first one, uh, if you you know go to the link that I just shared and scroll down below the agenda, then there is something about um, you know the proposed bylaws changes. The first one is to um, add Article 2, Section 8, Removal, Proposed Text. Any member of the Wisconsin Green Party may be removed from membership in the organization for gross misconduct or violation of the adopted key values, platform, or code of conduct adopted by the party by decision of the membership or the coordinating council. Notice of such a proposed removal must be sent out prior to the meeting where it is proposed. The candidate or elected official in question shall receive a notice before the meeting at which the decision is to be made and a hearing if requested. Um, the background is that this is copied from the language on removing a candidate or elected official from the party. And it creates a similar mechanism for holding rank and file members accountable for gross misconduct. And while we fortunately have not felt the need or the necessity for this type of mechanism in past years, it is important as our party grows that we create mechanisms for accountability and to protect our party from bad actors. Um, so uh, first of all, um, we'll ask if there are any clarifying questions. Uh, so if you have any clarifying questions, uh, please get on the stack and we'll call on people in the order that they get on. Okay, so I see Sam on the stack. Go ahead, or Sam Chance. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, so um, I guess what I'd be wondering is as far as the um, it being sent out prior to the meeting, them being notified prior to the meeting, um, would that be an hour prior to the meeting? Would it be five minutes? Would it be a day? Um, because I could obviously see that being <laughs> used in a in a way where it's like okay it's five minutes before the meeting we're gonna vote on you being removed you get the notification you don't really practically have time to respond to it pass okay yeah good question thanks um so then we also have carrie brass and barb dahlgren on the stack so go ahead carrie okay um i have a question uh, how are we to meaningfully distinguish gross misconduct from the ordinary conflict of descending opinions one might expect to encounter in a democratic organization? That's a good question as well. Um, so Barb is next on the stack. Go ahead, Barb. I. I wanted to try and take a shot at answering um, some of these clarifying questions, if that's okay. Um, we have in our, um, our rules that usually you need a week prior to a meeting to send out notices about meetings. So um, in a timely manner would probably be a week, but um, we could have a friendly amendment to this saying that it has to be a week prior. Um, gross misconduct versus just um, general butting of heads in a political party, I would think 
Um, a lot of that has to really be decided in the meeting. Um, we do have some channels for dealing with conflict like our dispute resolution committee. So if let's say um, Carrie and I have a conflict with each other before um, it gets out of hand, we could ask to have the dispute resolution committee hear that conflict and do some conflict resolution um, long before it gets to the point that, you know, we're doing something so terrible to one another or um, really abusing the lists of our group and the communication channels of our group so that hopefully we avoid any, any major issues like that. Pass. Thanks, Barb. Um, so next, uh, Thistle is on the stack. And then uh, we also have Carrie. Um, Carrie just spoke, so I will uh, put myself on the stack uh, first so I can respond to Carrie's previous question. So we'll go Thistle, then me, then Carrie. Go ahead, Thistle. Yeah, um, who is going to decide who the bad actors are and what is gross misconduct? Who, who decides that? OK, good question. So as Barb mentioned, we have a dispute resolution committee. And um, when there is a conflict within the party, then that can be brought to the dispute resolution committee. So we have dispute resolution processes that are uh, adopted from the national party uh, so that um, you know, people who are not involved with the conflict can attempt to mediate and um, you know, there are two different kinds of conflicts, one which involves a dispute over a decision made by the party and deciding whether that such a decision is legitimate. Um, and there, there also involves interpersonal conflict, um, you know, where, again, you know, people may feel like they have been mistreated uh, and, you know, then Usually in those situations, we need uh, an independent third party to evaluate and investigate the situation and hopefully mediate the situation so that we can have restorative justice and you know, move forward. Um, but you know, we also need mechanisms for accountability. Uh, so yeah, so the dispute resolution committee would be the first tier uh, and, you know, then ultimately it would come to a decision of either the coordinating council or the membership, uh, you know, to make a decision, uh, you know, if the dispute resolution committee was unable to, you know, come to that. And the question of, you know, what differentiates misconduct from disagreement. Uh, so the code of conduct uh, lays out you know, what behavior is acceptable and, you know, what behavior is unacceptable. And, you know, it, uh, some of these things are always a little bit subjective, um, but we're trying, you know, as much as possible to create a, you know, professional and independent dispute resolution process. Um, and, you know, ultimately, sometimes it comes down to a judgment call. But, you know, I think also everyone can agree that there is certain behavior, um, you know, mistreatment of others that, you know, should not be tolerated within the Green Party. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that there are uh, procedures to avoid that and to hold people accountable, you know, if they are engaging in that sort of behavior. So there's the code of conduct um, and uh, other policies that have been adopted by the party, uh, including our bylaws. So those, um, you know, are available for everyone to review. So now we have Carrie, Mike, and Bill on stack. Go ahead, Carrie. 
so what I'm hearing here is that this um, proposed bylaw change could be used to police dissent. And to me, that seems very authoritarian. And I'm concerned about that in a party that is supposed to thrive on uh, respect for diversity and uh, grassroots democracy. Okay. Um, so, and also if, if folks can say pass when they're done speaking, that will help us know when to move on. Uh, so then now we have Mike, Bill, Monty, and Barb. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, do we have uh, uh, an example or, an, or a, a historical reference uh, for when we've ex uh, tossed out an elected official or, or, or more on the or, or even on the regular membership side uh, anywhere because uh, I think that might be a, a useful I imagine that this would be rarely invoked but don't know for sure let me give you a quick response Mike um, so before we move on the discussion uh, the Connecticut Green Party recently uh, unendorsed a candidate who made a social media post that seemed to be advocating violence um, against, uh, you know, people who commit theft. Um, and yeah, so that that would be one example of the you know Green Party using its process. I mean, not in this state, but using its process to unendorse a candidate who, you know, violated uh, their uh, principles. Um, so next up we have Bill. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. <clears throat> well, one thing that this is not about is policing dissent. I got involved in the Greens <clears throat> during the Nader campaign, I was intermittently involved over the next decade or so. I've been consistently involved in the Wisconsin Greens for the last six or eight years. And um, I have never been in an organization that is more respectful, courteous, friendly, and collegial than the way people treat each other in the Greens. That's our norm. That's how it is almost all the time. However, in, in, in all this time, I don't even remember anybody being as much as censured. Maybe I'm wrong. So this is um, the um, circumstance that this bylaws um, proposal anticipates is something that might and should be very, very rare. But during this election campaign, we've had the opportunity to see a lot of really bad actors out there. Some of them have very large guns. Some of them kill people. Um, not to say that we should anticipate that sort of thing taking place in our ranks, but it would be good to have some language in place that says there are certain types of conduct and ways of um, carrying on that we will not tolerate. And um, I did see this um, conflict, conflict resolution committee used one time so far, and I think uh, pretty effectively. So I, I think that the norm is going to be going forward that if we do have any difficulties or personality conflicts or whatever, that we're going to really bend the stick in the direction of working long and hard to resolve them collegially and respectfully amongst ourselves. But if we have someone that is incorrigible, disrupts the work of our organization, someone who doesn't hold our values, doesn't agree with us politically, um, we need to reserve the right to take action to protect ourselves. 
Now, the only thing I can remember that seemed even close to that is I remember a couple of years ago at a Greater Milwaukee Green Party meeting, a guy walked in and uh, said he was a Green uh, and then proceeded to kind of denounce in a very uh, wild fashion, most of us, and then he left. I'm not sure who he was, but if that person decided to stick around for our whole meeting and disrupt uh, and, and continue saying some of the things he did, um, we might, um, after using our con a conflict resolution mechanism, we might want to consider that this was uh, 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 functioning or operating in a uh, grossly unacceptable fashion. So um, I think we need some language in our bylaws to address a potential situation like this. Pass. All right, next we have Monty. And also, please- Can you hear me? Yeah, and right. we're almost to our break time, so let's right. try to- I'll be quick. In, in most contexts, I would see this and I'd be oh, like uh, what Kiri said. Um, but two or three things. First, uh, as Bill mentioned, we're famous for not only not needing this, but also it's unlikely we'll ever use it. If you look at our history, people forget about these things. They don't care about these things. Nobody gets around to these things. If somebody raises a dispute, we'll resolve it better this next time. That's what this is for. And I keep looking at it and it's very professional. And the more professional I think it is, the more I think, gee, if we had a legal department, they'd have had us do this a decade ago. And so to finish, Gary, democracy and diversity require policing of abusive behaviors. You can't have democracy when half the people don't want to show up because some butthead might be there. And so, you know, should that butthead be me? I want to get kicked out, <laughs> period. I want to know about it first, but we're not even good at that. So I, I am so down with this. Pass. Thanks, Monty. Um, so we have, uh, let's see, Barb, and then Thistle, Bruce, Sam, um, okay, and we probably won't get through our whole discussion before break, so um, if people could try and make their comments quick, and then if we don't get to you, if, if you can uh, put your comments in the chat, and then, you know, when we get back, we can pick up where we left off, uh, but, you know, we still have a lot of business to get to, so remember, we're not deciding on this today, this is just discussion, so Hopefully this will help us to make a better proposal. All right, so uh, next up we have Barb. Yeah, I wanted to say that I'm in support of this. Um, we'll be voting on it at the spring gathering, but this is a really important discussion. Um, I just want, people are probably like, why are they doing this now after all these years of um, having the same um, rules about removal that um, that we always had, um, we are getting more attention than ever. And not all of that is good attention. Uh, a lot of it is a bunch of trolls coming from the Democratic Party coming into our spaces and telling us that we shouldn't have any existence at all and arguing with us about having candidates, like really basic things in our um, political atmosphere. Uh, we have people coming in who say that they're with us and then it turns out that they're um you know not supportive of our our four pillars that they um you know they have a major bunch of disagreements with us and think that they now own the green party so to um, have a democracy we need to have rules to stop that kind of behavior so that we all can coexist together even if we do have some uh, lesser disagreements with each other on how to do things. So that's kind of um, why we have this in here now. Um, having a, a really good ethics and, um, you know, process for this stuff so that it's fair, no matter who's on the other end of it, using that 
um, what's that uh, word, legal term, the, the curtain, so that if you were on the other side of it, that you would be okay with the results. Uh, that's really important to us. So uh, with that, I'll pass. Okay. Thanks. So now we're at 12.30. Uh, so this is our scheduled break time. So we want to honor that and give people half an hour for lunch. Uh, like I said, for the folks who are still on the stack, uh, please try to put your comments into the comments section uh, so that we can keep moving things along. But we will pick up where we left off uh, at 1 p.m. when we get back from our lunch break. So thanks, everyone, for sticking with it. Uh, like I said, this is the most in the weeds we get discussing bylaws changes. Um, so after lunch, we will pick up where we left off, bylaws, elections, uh, then we'll have our guest speakers and uh, discussion. Uh, and that will be very exciting. So um, see you all at one. And yeah, see you soon. Well, I had a late breakfast, so I ain't going to lunch. Anybody want to chat? I drank my breakfast, or rather, yeah, you still am doing so. <laughs> yeah, that's between smoking and, and kefir, peach. I kind of don't need breakfast. Uh, I can't find the word abuse. So I floated the idea of a meeting at six o'clock on Opa vote, six o'clock, seven o'clock. I mean, the Q&A is going to go on probably until. Uh -huh. Wait, Bullying. this meeting going on till seven? No, no, no. But I think we're going to have a Q&A that will probably let's say if it ends at if the official meeting ends at four, we might have a half an hour question and answer and then the back office people we still have to work out details on the ballot yeah we, we also have to remember to self-nominate and i'm not sure when that comes up i, I lost track <laughs> no you self-nominate online or did we already do that you, I you, already... you, you well self... we need to give someone to approve uh, the ability to, to, to vote us down don't we yeah when does the I voting see. process take place mm -hmm. Uh, that's Sunday, a good question. It Sunday, starts Sunday. about the time, the, not till tomorrow? Not till tomorrow. We're not sending a, it starts after we okay. send the ballots out. We got to review the eligible voter list. It'll be open at, sorry. We got to finalize the ballot, um, right? It, it, it'll be open uh, at least a day, I think. Staff. At least not, a day. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get something to eat. This is informal, Jen. You don't have to stack. <laughs> I know, but I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wasn't sure if you were here. I was doing something with something. Um, yeah, uh, I tried to um, up, um, do, um, contribute my uh, membership fee, and it keeps sending me back to the volunteer the volunteer sign up page after I put on put all my credit card information in. And I've done that twice already. Did we lose Tom? I'm sorry, I wasn't listening to that. <laughs> I was trying to pay my dues, right? Oh. And it's like I put it in twice already and it it keeps sending me to the volunteer sign-up page. 
I don't know if the, if the transaction went through or what what's going we on. You can definitely check that before you try again. Um, <laughs> I'm not uh, yet real familiar with that in, uh, side of things. So I think we're going to need someone like uh, Barb or Tom on on here to get you an answer. That sounds like a tech thing. Probably I don't. Tom. I just don't <laughs> want to start mucking about in that. Then I haven't. When it's got to do with finance, <laughs> which is kind of a vicious circle because I try to avoid that kind of thing. But <laughs> what I time I learned right now. Uh, would I be so able to grab some lunch too? So. Go ahead. Sorry. Would I be able to give my uh, membership dues to someone because I don't have a working debit card? Yeah. Um, are you like in Milwaukee? Correct. I thought so. Uh, I believe the easiest way for you to kind of hit two birds with one stone is, and I'm not sure on any details but Barb mentioned last night she was planning on having a get together at her house after the meeting and if you went there that would probably be easily taken care of uh Barbara are you there yeah what? I'm here what's up what time is the get together uh if people want to hang out at like six o'clock okay I'll, I'll be around I'll have because I gotta around. be I gotta be at the bus station at seven Ooh. So, Which one? Um, the one downtown. You're like okay, like, like the Greyhound bus station. Um, where do you live? Uh, Bayview, basically. Uh, St. Francis, really. Like to get home. Yeah, you could hit Barb on the way there after six Actually, before I'm, seven. I'm visiting. I'm visiting my friend in Whitewater today. Mm -hmm. and the bus leaves at 7 p.m. So that's why I need to get to the uh, do you, downtown do you bus drive? station. I do not, sadly. It's all right. I could see coming and getting you, which would make it real easy for you if you did drive. If you don't drive, it, it would be rough. On the bus, I wouldn't even try. Of course, that's not your only option, I'm sure. There's a lot of us in town, and I'm not even sure who would take the cash. Barb, who's treasurer? <laughs> um, I'm kind of a newbie, even though I've been around forever, because mm -hmm. I was living in the mid-state for most of the last 12 years. So I'm uh, <laughs> went all right over my head there, both of you guys. Um, both of our treasures. Again, it had to do with money. <laughs> so I lost. Right now, so um, Patty lives closest to you, Sam, but also Bill is really the guy who's... Um, who will take checks and he's on the east side right in cambridge by would, would you be able to send me patty's address or um maybe when patty gets back i should have her send you her address oh yeah yeah and can we add him to the voter list on promise to pay so to speak yeah so good well sam wanted to be a candidate and sam can't be a candidate if he's not a member <laughs> oh even better but, awesome yeah, so i'm good with that you know sam is, is good glad to see it uh there were times when it, we would not have shown that kind of flexibility and i'm glad to see it josh might be an infiltrator I'm the infiltrator, Bruce, don't you know? <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding, of course, but how do you know? I am the one who brings oh, it up. You're an most. agent provocateur. What? You're an agent provocateur. Could easily be called that, but I'm only working for me. But I'll tell you. If I wasn't me, um, I would follow my advice and, and I tend to try not to say anything about the entire subject except this. The person who keeps bringing it up, that's probably who it is. <laughs> that's your first suspect, is the one who keeps talking about it. And so since I keep saying that, um, I, it makes me a suspect by definition, by mine, so to speak. There have been 
agents provocateurs, I think, at the national level. There's people I've suspected. But that I just hasn't really gone you there. Gotta kinda, you got to kind of assume they're there. Mm. It's hard. Yeah, if, if you're having the same impact, what's the difference? There's my way of looking at it. But when you look uh, at the amount of money only... the Democrats have to throw around, they could easily pay somebody I... to be an informant. I doubt if they would bother at the state level, but I'd I've only seen the national level. I've only seen evidence of professional intelligence when <laughs> I tried to write the history of the PSN for the third time in five years and found that the only history there was to write was our records got entire, including their list, uh, you know, our, our member list, our records got li- ripped off twice. Just every time somebody finished a history, they ripped off the records. I was the third attempt and I didn't finish the attempt. <laughs> so there was no place to put the record. <laughs> you know, if P- Progressive Student Network is a student network. You don't, you didn't have, an old guard. <laughs> we were only seven years old by the time we stopped kind of doing anything. And and that was big time why? Because we didn't have a fucking membership. Sorry, people. We didn't have a membership list. And uh, without a membership I mean. list, you don't have an organization. Much less a network of them. But that was 1985. <laughs> Methods are not so crude and obvious anymore. Um, this is this is kind of off topic, but so is what um, we were talking about. <laughs> but, um, I was I was planning on a uh, running for school board, and awesome. I was wondering uh, in 2023, and I was wondering if there was a process to get the Green Party's endorsement. Oh yeah. But it's not hard. I mean, it's not complicated at the very least. Um, candidate questionnaire is the first step. It's a we can't hear you, Tom. Oh, you can't hear me still? No, I can't. So there's a candidate questionnaire. It's about, boy, it's about 25 questions. It'll take you a while to fill out. Um, so that's the formal process. You need to answer that. And then, uh, then it goes through a committee. Um, probably the coordinating council takes a week or so to look that through. And then uh, we also started to do like uh, a landlord background check kind of thing, you know, just to make sure um, there's no skeletons in your closet, you know? (laughs) Um, So yeah, that's the overview. Oh, and one other thing. So occasionally the agent provocateurs rise right up into the ranks and become co-chairs and they, get into the IT, like I should be a suspect, right? I'm in IT. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm saying is they, they're in it for the long haul. So they may just be um, assets being, you know, waiting and acting completely, you know, positively. And then when they're engaged, you know, it's, it's over. <laughs> Pass. Thank you. Yeah, if I were, maybe just put it in the chat as a reminder, and I'll try after lunch to give you a link to the document so you can start looking at it. My sister told me, um, when he spent all that time cutting, cutting up the salad, just eat the individual things in the salad spread out throughout the day. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to do. Oh, God, I'm sorry.
Hey, how's it going, Dad? Are you still on me? Yeah, I'm on, or, uh, I'm on intermission right now, but yeah. How's it coming? Pretty good.
say we're recording. Do you remember on the before the break? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Say we know we're recording this break, right? So, sorry, what was that? You know, you know we're recording this break. <laughs> yeah, Probably. Right. I wouldn't see why we. Uh, we it's, don't have. We don't have. I mean, I, I, can, I can do the job, but I, I, I don't know how to use the tools we're working with to do it lately. So. Uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, you don't want to turn who cares. <laughs> what? You don't want to. You don't want to turn the recording off and then forget to turn it back on. Yeah, we for one chop, thing, we can chop it, chop it out if we. If someone has the energy to do the edit. Um, well, and if we're gonna, if we're gonna have something like this dispute resolution document, uh, well, that's not the right word for it, you know. But uh, we might as well start thinking like. Uh, lawyers as as a party uh we share a, a lot of concerns with corporations particularly a party who stands for what we do and who's been impacting this 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 part of the law i mean i mean whose ideologies have been in, in impacting this part of the law um yeah i did a survey of about four different code of conduct documents and then i found well, an this anti, is I found an anti code of conduct document. Yeah. Because, I mean, it, it can be, the whole thing can be abused. You know, the oh, well, yeah. Conduct. I think the, the, and and I believe, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Carrie has pegged the actual word that's most, most abused and, and most likely to get abused. Um, and, and that's abuse. <laughs> She's right. I don't know that that should be in there, but bullying is also over general. And as a part of the definition of bullying, I don't know if that's. He worked. So he worked quite a bit. I mean, I think he pulled that definition probably out of some other document. Yeah, but I just well, Monty, I, think, uh, I think it's awesome. It's a good choice. Monty, <sighs> did you look at the um, at the definition of bullying in the code of conduct? Because it's really yeah. pretty specific. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did. And uh, again, as I put in the chat, that that is, I that actually when I got to the word of abuse is when I started feeling Carrie's point, uh, and it was just before she said it, so it was remarkably easy to remember. But because uh, I've never seen it before. I but just I, let I, you I, know that this is a five hundred one c four, which is a corporation. Um, so even though we exactly. are exactly corporate we ourselves are a corporation and we're, we're <laughs> a corporation with a particular concern for our political image as a matter of fact is what i'm trying to say but thank you very much for helping me clarify <laughs> uh, and i'm going to eat in front of you all unless you just want me to turn off the camera because this is my kitchen table my kitchen counter <laughs> Uh, right here. That was a perfect area. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, not perfect. I, I, I've been wanting to rebuild the desk since the day I built it, but I, when I moved in, I had a mess of my dad's paintings blocking me from getting back behind it again, and now it's blocked in again. Just, Monty, so I kind of got to clean my house to, to, to do anything about rearranging my screens, much less thinking about rebuilding my desk. Yeah. Be aware that the sound causes the speaker view, so that if you make noises with your forks and spoons, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I was on. Be... No, let me get rid of that speaker too. And I, uh, oh, I I, I I'm was... just saying that um, you become the foreground speaker if you make noise. So yeah, well, I'm going to make bit... feedback too if I don't cut this out. <laughs> Probably better already. It sounds better to me.
if any of you are kind of thinking about um, leadership positions during the break, um, just kind of pondering whether or not you could take on that sort of responsibility. Um, I would encourage you to go for it that because this is a democratically organized party, we are all leaders in some way or another. And um, we all have something good to contribute. So if you're thinking about it, you might as well try out for it. The uh, coordinating council positions are one year long and there's 12 meetings every year, pretty much. So if you can come to the meetings, if you can bring some ideas, it's great to have more people. All right, two minute warning. Oh, okay. Okay, I don't need to go through. Okay, thank you. They charged me twice, damn it. Who said that? Okay, it's now 1 p.m. Uh, so let's get restarted here. Uh, so we can pick up where we left off. We're in discussion of the first uh, proposed change to the bylaws. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion in the comments. So thanks everyone for continuing that there. Uh, is there anyone who hasn't yet spoken on this who would like to? Um, please get on the stack and uh, you know, are there any uh, burning issues that have not yet been addressed in the discussion or uh, in the comments that need to be? So if you have either of those, if you haven't spoken yet on this, or uh, if there's a new issue um, that you know needs to be raised in this discussion, please get on the stack. Okay, so uh, I see Carrie on the stack. Go ahead. Oh, thanks, Dave. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, oh, here, I'm sorry, I've got myself off. Um, I wanted to ask, so far the discussion's only been about proposal one and not about proposal two, is that correct? Or is this a joint discussion? That's correct. We haven't gotten to the second proposal yet. Okay, thank you. Okay. But um, if there is no further discussion on the first proposal, then we can move along to the second. Um, so let's do that since I'm not seeing anyone else on the stack. Okay, so the second proposed bylaws change. Uh, amend Article 10, discrimination. 
Section 1, Conduct. So the proposed text is to change from current language, discrimination on the basis of sex, race, age, religion, economic status, sexual orientation, ethnic identity, national origin, handicap, parenthood, or color in the conduct of the affairs of the Wisconsin Green Party is prohibited. Uh, so change that from that to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, race, ethnicity, culture, national origin, social and economic class, educational level, color, immigration status, sex, age, size, family status, religion, or mental or physical ability in the conduct of the affairs of the Wisconsin Green Party is prohibited. Um, so this updates the language on discrimination in the Wisconsin Green Party bylaws in accordance with the Wisconsin Green Party Code of Conduct and the proposed Green Party U.S. Code of Conduct. Um, yeah, and basically, you know, the Wisconsin Green Party bylaws were written um, quite a long time ago, I think originally in the 1980s. So there is some language that hasn't been updated in quite a while. Um, and <laughs> Also, the, uh, the Green Party U.S. is currently working on a proposed code of conduct. As Bruce mentioned, um, they've tabled a lot of their activity, you know, during election season because people were preoccupied with elections. But, um, but yeah, basically this just updates the language on discrimination, uh, you know, to make sure that we cover more categories and update some language um, around, you know, different classes that are, you know, historically or, you know, currently uh, marginalized and discriminated against in our society. Um, so I will ask, uh, are there any clarifying questions regarding this proposal? Okay, um, not seeing any questions regarding the proposal. Is there any discussion? Okay, uh, I see Thistle on the stack. Go ahead, Thistle. I, I'm wondering why parenthood was taken out as a class because as you know, women traditionally have been discriminated against when they get pregnant and have a child, but that, that can be a point of discrimination. So I'm just wondering why parents taken out? Thanks. Um, so, yeah, that's a good question. I believe uh, that has just been updated to family status. Um, so that would cover parenthood as well as other uh, you know, family statuses. So it wouldn't just apply to parents, it would also apply, you know, to children and other other family members. And it, it would uh, prevent or prescribe um, any sort of di discrimination based on family status. Uh, that's my understanding. Maybe if, if anyone else has, uh, you know, any uh, response to that, then feel free to get on the stack. Pass. I'm trying to have a direct response, but I don't know if, if, if I can. Just wondering, you know, family status could be children, and so you can't discriminate against a child, but yet children cannot become members of the Green Party, but being a child under a certain age is a family status. I don't know, I feel like par parenthood is a very specific status that traditionally has been discriminated against. There's not really anything that stops a child from being a member. Uh, yeah, if we could stick to the stack. Thanks, Monty. Uh, so Barb is on the stack next. Yeah. Hey, I 
I can respond to um, the idea that children, can they be members? People um, 16 and older can become members of the Wisconsin Green Party, can really become members of um, any Green Party in the United States because our uh, young green starts at age 16. Pass. Okay. Um, thanks, Barb. So we have Sam Chance on stack, then Tomas Ward. So go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I mean, I guess <clears throat> as far as the uh, parenthood versus um, feeling the status language, um, you know, certainly we can reasonably um, lump, or I don't want to say lump, but, you know, we can reasonably include parenthood um, as a family status. So the family status language would be inclusive of discrimi discrimination based upon parenthood. Pass. Okay, Tomas. Hey, thanks. Um, I uh, agree that it might be worthwhile to keep parenthood in as a specific uh, word and maybe there's a can, can there can be a friendly amendment for that and um, also w share the concern that's in the comments about um, uh, sex being moved down the list of discriminatory potential categories past okay thank you Um, and thanks for putting comments in the comments in the chat. Um, okay, um, as Bill says, there's no particular significance to the order. Um, I agree with that. I don't think that uh, the order uh, is intended to convey any sort of hierarchy of oppressions at all. Um, and also, I you know agree with what Barb said, and Sam, uh, you know, family status includes parenthood, um, but is not limited to parenthood. And um, you know, we we do have um, certain age requirements, but I will note that they are uh, significantly lower than the voting age uh, in the country, uh, as well as you know requirements for participation in most parties. Um, in fact, I believe in the National Youth Caucus, you can join starting at age 14. Um, but I would need to, to fact check that. Um, so, all right, um, are there any other questions or discussion regarding this proposal? Okay, not seeing any. Well, thanks everyone. Um, as we talked about before, our process is that uh, by proposed bylaws changes go through a discussion phase at one meeting. Uh, you know, all the feedback is valuable and taken into consideration. And then at our next um, membership meeting in the spring, we will move forward to make a decision on those proposed bylaws changes. Um, so let's move on to our elections phase and we only have about an hour before our guest speakers start. Uh, so as noted before, we are electing, um, our officers, um, coordinating council representatives at large and district representatives, uh, congressional district representatives, uh, as well as national committee delegates and alternates. 
So um, here is what we, I have so far. I'm just pasting into the chat. Um, this is, to the best of my knowledge, people who have self-nominated so far for the various positions. And um, we're open to more self-nominations from the floor if uh, people would like. So um, I'll just go through these quickly uh, to make sure that everything is accurate. If it doesn't look accurate, you know, if, if your name should be there but isn't, or if it is but shouldn't be, uh, please speak up to let us know. And if you would like to uh, throw your name into the ring for uh, any position, then uh, please also speak up on that. We're trying to finalize our list of candidates uh, for these officer positions, um, and then we'll be able to, uh, you know, everyone will be able to say uh, a few words about their candidacy. We'll have some discussion, and then um, as soon as our IT committee is ready, uh, they will send out the ballots to all members in good standing who will be able to vote. And um, we are, we're originally hoping to have the ballot ready today. Looks like it, it might have to wait until tomorrow. Um, but uh, yeah, so let me quickly uh, list the candidates that, I, that we have right now. And then uh, we'll open it up for um, corrections and further self-nominations. So uh, there's one open co-chair position. Um, and uh, Joe Nathan Kingfisher has self-nominated. Uh, for operations treasurer, Bill Bryan has self-nominated. For elections treasurer, we have Patty Ashby. For recording secretary, we have Sam Michael. For Correspondence Secretary, we have Jeffrey Lewis. Um, for Coordinating Council uh, District Seats, in District 2, we have Thistle Pedersen and Sam Chance. In District 5, we have Bruce Hankforth. Um, at large, uh, I have not seen any so far. Uh, also, for other uh, for other uh, congressional districts, I haven't seen any candidates uh, uh, self nominate so far. Tom, Tom Stack. Uh, let me just get through the list, Tom, and then uh, we'll take the stack. So for national committee delegates, we have Sam Michael, Dave Schwab, Bruce Hankforth, and Thistle Pedersen. For national committee alternates, we have Tom Rodman and Mike McAllister. All right. So then we have. Uh, Sam Michael on stack and um, let's see Monty Letourneau um, has a comment which I don't quite understand that I heard Tom trying to get on stack okay um, and then Thistle wants to be added to at large and also for alternate Okay, so um, go ahead, uh, Sam Michael. Okay, um, so what I have two questions. Is the at large, uh, is the job of the at large member basically the same as District 2 and District 5? And um, what would, what areas are District 2 and District 5? Like of Wisconsin? Uh, yeah, that's yes. a great question. Um, yeah, so let me let me re directly respond to those questions. Um, so, yes, the um, the CD, the congressional district representatives, and the at-large representatives have an equal vote on the coordinating council. Um, you know, as we mentioned before, the um, Congressional district representative should be seen as a an organizer for that congressional district who should, um, you know, work to organize uh, a chapter in their congressional district, you know, if if none already exists, and you know they should be accountable 
to the members in that district. The at-large representatives are accountable to the membership at large. Um, and as for your second question, uh, can someone share in the chat a, an up-to-date map of congressional districts in Wisconsin? Um, gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, if you know who your member of Congress is, then that kind of makes it easier. Um, you know, as unfortunate as it is, but uh, CD1 is uh, Style, I think the name is. CD2 is Pocan. CD3 is Kind. CD4 is More. CD5 is Sensenbrenner. CD6, I think, is Growthman. Um, CD7, um, I'm Tiffany. Uh, yeah, I'm blanking on CD7 and CD8. Uh, but if if someone can share that congressional district map, that'll that'll give you an idea of you know what your congressional district is. It's in the chat. But, um, Tiffany sorry. and Gallagher. Only. Uh, District two and five are open this election cycle. Only those positions are open out of the seven. No, uh, that yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, uh, all of them are open. All of the congressional. Oh, okay. Districts. Yeah. Um, I was going to throw my hat in the name if four was open, but. Uh, okay. Yeah, and it looks like Tom Rodman has also put in for CD four and Tomas Ward for CD5. Um, sorry, just catching up on the chat here. Uh, these people nominated, these people nominated in the process of forming the, uh, the election last night. Or were at, <clears throat> or were added there uh, okay. to, by request. There's a question for Tomas. Are you in CD five or six? CD six. Okay. So, uh, so T Tomas Ward should be CD six, not CD five. Yeah. What are the reasons I was posting it there? I was going to ask people to check me on that because uh, it got a little confusing near the end of the CDs. So, thank you, Thomas. Okay, Barb is nominating for at-large CC rep. Um, okay, and um, just a, a quick question. Are, are folks able to nominate, are we, um, are folks able to self-nominate for both a CD rep and an at-large position? No, because I would fill two seats with one person and deprive of a civil full council. Uh, oh. uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, but if if I have, asked that last night, that's how I was so quick on the draw. Let's say somebody uh, wants to go to C three people want to go to CD four. But one of those people is also willing to go at large. Seems like we should be able to handle that in one election if possible. So they lose for CD4, but then they get the at large position. That's that's a good point. And you should be able to run for more than, but you can only hold one. And so uh, in the case that, well, if we don't, it, it, we can't let them eliminate candidates in the in, in, in one of the races is what I'm saying. And but we can handle that on the back end just fine. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think clearly you can only hold one uh, one of the offices. I mean, you can't have two seats on the court in the council. Yeah, I got to so, think. The question is, can you run for both? And the answer is yes. And I thank the question, uh, very, questioner very much for uh, clarifying the issue. Very, very much. Okay. 
All right. So the the decision is that you can run both for the um, CD rep and for the at large seat. Um, you know, but but if you, you win if you win the rep, you won't be allowed to eliminate someone from CD rep such that there isn't someone filling that seat. That won't be an issue. Right. Uh, if you if I you just win, was too tired to answer my own question last night, so thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so if you win the CD rep seat, then that takes you out of the running for the at large. Um, all right, so there's a question from Bruce. Um, and first, let me just ask, is someone keeping a master list of candidates here? I'm trying um, to. Oh, okay, thanks, Bill. Thank you, Bill. I'll trying try to, to back you up. I'll try to back you up. And between okay. us, we should have it. So there's a question about the difference between operations and elections treasurers, and between the correspond the recording and correspondence secretaries. So um, I will refer people to our officers and committees page, which has more details about the officers' positions. Um, yeah, so that will explain in more depth um, The just for a quick response, the treasurer positions, um, the, the difference is very nitty gritty, so I won't go into it right now. But for the secretaries, it's more clear cut. The recording secretary takes notes at um, our CC meetings and our state gatherings. Um, and the correspondence secretary, their main responsibility is to check our PO box in Madison. Okay. So uh, I see Bill on stack. Is there anyone else on stack? Go ahead, Bill. Actually, I think Barbara just and, uh, made the point I wanted to make, and that is the uh, elections treasurer. Um, Patty's going to, she's offered to do that. It's a job I would not want. Uh, j just in the sense that you've got to fill in all of these state um, forms uh, online, which are um, not very nice. Um, the operations treasurer is the one that handles all the inflow of money and dues uh, and the day-to-day -day stuff. The uh, elections treasurer has to do all of that, um, all that re governmental reporting. Pass it. All right, we have Patty on the stack and then Monty. Go ahead, Patty. Yeah, Bill clarified. I was just going to get on to clarify the um, elections um, officer for finance. And just what Bill said, basically it's a matter of submitting financial reports on our elections activity um, on a, a twice a year basis. And essentially that's what it is. It's quite a long process. And then making sure that our um, accounts balance as far as um, the elections side of income and expense pass. Monty? Uh, the election treasurer is the most uh, critical uh, officer in the, in the party. They have to know election law. And when they break it, we're all, we're all in trouble. And so uh, it just now occurs to me that that's the one officer who should have to show their creds in this context if we continue to, to do things like this. But uh, um, that's, I just wanted to add that, uh, it, 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 a good example is this last election, um, where the election treasurer had to know certain things or, or certain other things weren't going to happen. Um, you know, if Howie didn't file right, he wouldn't even have been able to get counted on, uh, and, and anyways, long story short, they got to know elections law more than any of the rest of us. And they're the ones 
who are most at risk of having us break it. Uh, pass. Okay. Thanks. Um, so there is a question about how many CDs do we have covered for candidates right now? Um, that's a good question. Um, by my count, we have candidates for District 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, and also, I would note that right now, Sam Michael is the only candidate for recording secretary. So um, again, with the rule that you can't have more than one seat on the CC, uh, if Sam were to be elected as recording secretary, then um, you know he would not also be able to be a CD4 rep. But um, yeah, so I will share my updated list. Let's see. Oh, actually, so for at large, we had Thistle. Uh, we had Sam Chance. Um, did we have anyone else for at large? I think we have Barbara Dahlgren, don't we? Bar, yeah, thank you very much. And do we also have Barbara Dahlgren down for recording secretary? Did I see that? Um, uh, there's a yes that just, no, that's part of my. I was, I was a little confused about that. Um, I thought that Barb had withdrawn her name. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, um, I can, I can speak to that. Uh, I originally went for recording secretary, um, but seeing that there's some new people who'd like to, to try it out, I would rather see, um, see people who are new stepping up into that leadership position. So, um, I, I would be happy to withdraw. Done and gone. Duly noted. Thanks, Barb. Bro. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I, I just posted um, what I think is the updated list. So for co-chair, Joe Nathan Kingfisher. For operations, treasurer, Bill Bryan. Election treasurer, Patty Ashby. Recording secretary, Sam Michael. Correspondent secretary, Jeffrey Lewis. Coordinating council, District 2, Thistle Pedersen and Sam Chance. District 3, Cody Arendt. District 4, Tom Rodman and Sam Michael. District 5, Bruce Hinkforth. District 6, Tomas Ward. At large, Thistle Pedersen, Sam Chance, Barbara Dahlgren. Uh, National Committee delegates, Sam Michael, Dave Schwab, Bruce Hinkforth, and Thistle Pedersen. National Committee alternates, Tom Rodman, Mike McAllister, and Thistle Pedersen. Do we have any other self nominations? Well, I, Tom here, I would also go for at large if I don't get the CD4. <clears throat> uh, okay. So we'll add Tom Rodman to the CC at large. Okay, uh, and then Barb on stack. Yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody that the way this election works is that we can have eight at-large um, people at most, two national committee delegates and two national committee alternates at most. Um, but that said, we have a none of the above option. Um, so if you are, um, not interested in some candidates, we don't have winners by default like you, you can in the general elections. Um, you know, people do have to support other people as well. Pass. Thanks, Barb. Yeah, and um, so 
can we actually turn it over to Tom and Monty real quick for an explanation? So if you um, if you don't want you know to vote for a particular candidate, um, yeah, say that Joe Biden was one of the candidates for CC at large, and you know we wanted to make sure that Joe Biden couldn't just walk onto a spot in the CC like he walked into the presidency. Uh, <laughs> Did I say that? Um, so, uh, how would uh, with the with the current system that we're using, how do people, um, you know, express that you know they don't want this candidate uh, to be elected? Uh, Tom Stan. Uh, can I take that? Oh, um, sure. Tom thank first. You. Uh, oh, I, well, my short answer. Tom, don't, uh, don't actually don't actually know the answer to the question. Right. So I'm going on the, their site right now. And Here's the way it, I've I tested this for the spring election. I mean, the, you know, national. Um, and I believe we used it. Uh, what what happens is you get a list, and then you get a place to drag them to. And that way you have to opt in on a candidate. If you leave it where it was, it doesn't get voted for. In the order that they're arranged on your list, that's your ranking. So the one that's first in there, or that I think you can drag it once you've pulled it across. And, and you, and so your top one that you drag over. So you have to first opt in on, on the candidates you want, and then you rank those. So that way you're very specifically not ranking the others. In other words, it gives you a chance to express disapproval because you could rank them under the other ones, but you're not ranking them as opposed to if you list them in a, in, in a, in a and then if you just don't put a number by them, you're kind of ranking them. And Monty, so then you're rank, rank enhanced versus rank simple. You want to, yeah, that's, that's the option we're talking about. And, and, and what happens there is, is it gives you a chance both in the ownership of the vote to be opting in and not just passively selecting or not, but it, it de facto can be taken as our bylaws ask us to, to mean not those. And, and so you're, we haven't set it up to do this, but potentially it could be set up to give those a negative one. And if we wanted to make that choice to do so, we could do it ourselves on the back end in our head or on paper. It's real simple. Uh, I, don't, time, I don't know what else to say. Stack. Okay, so it sounds like um, if you know if you don't wish to to vote uh, for someone, so you know if you've made your rankings of the candidates who you want to elect, and then you'd like to say, okay, none of the remaining candidates, then you simply do not add those candidates to your ranking. Right, exactly. and if and, right, and if in future we wanted to turn that down none of the above specifically into negative one, or you could actually then have a second ranking where you said, you know, uh, I, I rank this one most disliked and, 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 and that would, uh, uh, can be taken in, I believe. And if not, we could do it in two election, two, two questions on the same, uh, slate that, we could then adjust on the back end. But for now, that's the easiest way for us to get to a none of the above without arriving at ridiculous results when we try to resolve what do we do with that vote and how does it get its voice? And and so I say, let's just give us all the need to opt in on a candidate before they get any ranking at all. And then if nobody opts in on a candidate, they don't they don't win the election, they lose. Which okay. you're going to do anyways, because even if one person ranked them, they're probably going to lose. <laughs> so, Tom, stay. Uh, go ahead, uh, I'm done. Okay, uh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I, I think what what I'm, what I'm if I were to summarize, I would say that uh, we're speculating. And, you know, I was going to try and get on their site this afternoon and look for none of the above, but um, that 
using this rank enhanced choice, which allows you, which you basically have to drag. You could literally vote with a blank ballot and have nothing, nobody on there. You have to drag all the candidates you're going to rank onto the ballot in the order you want. That if for some reason it doesn't behave exactly the way we were hoping, we have access to all the anonymous ballots and we could run the, run the election through manually and we could implement the none of the above just by ourselves. But um, yeah, I mean, it seems intuitive to me that that that's what they're they're intending. But again, we'll we'll look into it this afternoon and tonight. Pass. I'd like to add one more thing. In my opinion, when I've had a class in the mathematics of probability that covered these issues, and it's a moot point, is what it really is, because none of the above doesn't really have any meaning in a ranked choice context. Yeah, but but we want to ex we want to express that ability to express a, a discontent with the remaining category candidates, and so this does that. You haven't selected them in. That gives us another data point that we can use to express that. However, we decided to. And I, I'm just saying it's hard to decide because it doesn't really have a context here. Okay, so that was a lot of words to basically say, uh, you know, rank the candidates that you support and don't rank the candidates that you don't support. And, you know, candidates that pass a certain threshold of support will win seats and candidates that don't pass that threshold will not win seats. Yeah, so, um, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Great. And if we want to decide that today, we can. If we want to make a proposal to formalize it uh, next time around, I think we should. Uh, if we don't, that'll probably work too. <laughs> because it, again, in my opinion, it's moot. But I think we need to deal with it somehow. And I and I love the. I've always wanted to have an election where you could vote against people. And yeah, we could, we could that's that next not, time. It's in our bylaws that we have none of the above voting yeah. and the elections committee made the decision on Tuesday. So the decision has already been taken. Right, right. I'm just saying how that gets expressed. It, it can get magnified. It, we can get more out of it if we want. Uh, okay. All yeah, right. It's just my own ax. I'm trying to grind by accident. I'm sorry. Okay. Moving on. Um, so we have a few people on stack. Uh, I see Bill, I see Carrie. Um, I see Mike, um, then a uh, quick question from uh, Barb Eisenberg at large. Yeah, it's for coordinating council. Sorry, I meant to, um, I left that part out, but where I wrote at large, that's CC at large. Um, so uh, go ahead. Um, uh, I'm sorry, who is the first person on it? Bill, Carrie, then Mike. Go ahead, Bill. It's what Dave said. <laughs> Ranked choice voting is wonderful. You can make it simple or you can make it very, very complex. Simple is better. Pick the people you like in order. If you run out of people that you like, stop. We've already got it set up. Let's go forward. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Carrie? I actually can pass. Uh, Bill clarified for me. I just wanted to be sure that you didn't necessarily, you if you want to rank three of four candidates, you can say one, two, three. And if you don't like the fourth candidate, just not put anything by their name. And that's where we're going. OK, thank yep, you. Yep, exactly. Yep, rank the candidates you like, and then, you know, don't rank the others. So, Devina, um, I want to I want to be very specific. You have to drain well, Monty, them from the. I'm Monty, sorry, I just thanks. okay. Let's keep moving. We've explained. Just it. simple. You drag it from one box. It, you can't leave. You, if you don't drag them all, don't leave them all there. You have to move them to vote. Um, yes. Yeah. That's that's how you will rank your candidates: is drag them from one box to another. Thank you. 
Um, okay. And then there was one other person on stack. I think it was Mike. Uh, can, it, since it appears we have one candidate for each of the uh, officer positions, uh, secretaries, treasurer, co-chair, can I just not, can, can I uh, uh, move to elect those people here or do we have to go through the formality? You can move to elect them. Uh, I would do so then. Okay. Um, so uh, the proposal is to uh, nominate the officer candidates as a slate. Um, yes. Monty, could you mute, please? I'm sorry. Uh, so, we, so we have for co chair, Joe Nathan Kingfisher, for operations treasurer, Bill Bryan. Elections Treasurer Patty Ashby, Recording Secretary Sam Michael, Correspondent Secretary Jeffrey Lewis. Um, and yeah, so we have uh, exactly one candidate for each open position. Uh, so yeah, I think it would simplify things if uh, we basically move those forward as a slate. Um, so I'll second that motion. Are there any questions or discussion? Okay, so it's been also been seconded by Bruce. Uh, Patty is on staff. <laughs> I think in the chat that Jeffrey said he's withdrawn his um, self nomination because it was it was something he put in months ago. If we can go back quickly through the chat and double check that. Uh, uh, yeah, yep. Yeah, I had I removed him. That was Jeffrey Jacobs. That's oh, the other so sorry. Okay. Uh, Tom Stack. Um, I would. This sounds great. I, I love it. Except that I want to be fair to the somebody. Maybe we might want to defer it. Somebody should go through Nation Builder. It's conceivable someone. I mean, I don't think you caught the fact that I self-nominated this morning uh, online. But I did, I did. In my email, but it was really a freak accident. So what I'm suggesting is. Somebody maybe in the next half an hour could just go on Nation Builder and verify that nobody snuck in, um, and then we could do this, go through this motion. You know, it would be embarrassing if someone else wanted to run for co-chair and we missed missed it. Yeah, I'm I'm actually checking that right now just to make sure there isn't anyone that we've missed, um, and I can confirm that. Yeah, there's. There's no one who's nominated through the page that. Oh yeah, you can look right at that page's own log. It's it's history. Yep. That's cool. Awesome. Okay. Yep. So okay. Uh, so Patty's off the stack. All right. So do we have um, you know, any uh, further unresolved concerns about? Uh, accepting these five officers as a slate. This is, oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? I'm on the yeah. stack. This is Barb oh, Eisenberg. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just want to express a concern about the, um, the lack, lack of gender balance, being a female myself, but not nominating myself for any, <laughs> any office. I, I want to encourage the other women um, to, to consider it, pass. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you for raising that point. I'm sorry, and I and I don't think it would be a bad thing to have, like, co-recording secretaries, so that if one person isn't available, um, the other person could could do the job. Is that okay? Um, yeah, that might require some further discussion. I mean, in our bylaws, it's just one yeah. person. Um, um, I just thought of that. Thank you. 
Yeah. I do know, you know, Barb has offered to, um, you know, be a mentor to whoever takes the, that position. And, you know, so maybe we could have some sort of informal arrangement. Um, we have Bill and Bruce on stack. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, just to address that concern, um, there are a couple of people who regularly volunteer to be substitute note takers when uh, secretaries have been uh, unavailable, and I'm one of them. So I think maybe between Barb and I, if there might be a situation where somebody um, has to miss a meeting, there's usually people to, to cover that for the one meeting. Thanks, Bill. Okay, uh, now we have Bruce on stack. Uh, he, I, I was gonna say the same thing that Bill said. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and we, um, you know, I'll just respond quickly to Barb, say that, you know, we do strive for gender balance and, you know, other kinds of balance uh, in our positions. And, you know, unfortunately we are a small organization and, you know, a lot of times the, um, you know, people who step up are the ones that we've got. So, um, yeah, it, it's certainly an important point. Um, and, you know, it's something that we'll continue to strive for. So, um, unless there are any other further unresolved concerns, I want to call the question of um, approving these uh, nominees as a slate for the officer positions. Um, so all in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Hallelujah. Aye. Uh, all opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, uh, all abstaining, please say meh. Not hearing any? Okay, uh, we have consensus. Congratulations and welcome to our new officers. <laughs> Can sparkle that. All right, so next up we have the um, Coordinating Council uh, and National Committee elections. All right, so here we do have some contested elections and we will be doing this by uh, secret ballot with the, um, the app is called OPA Vote. So all uh, members in good standing will receive a ballot, you know, as soon as they're ready and then we'll have a set period where you can get your vote in. Um, yeah, so uh, do folks want to start out by making a quick, uh, you know, just presentation, uh, you know, try to keep it to two minutes or less, uh, less would be great. And, um, you know, we'll just do one for each person, uh, you know, since we have some people who are running for uh, you know, more than one thing. Um, I'm also noting that Sam Michael, having been elected as a as recording secretary, um, will be taken out of the running for District 4 uh, CD rep. Um, so, yeah, so um, People can make their short presentations and then we'll have some time for discussion. And then the actual voting will take place after the meeting once the ballots are sent out. Uh, Tom and Monty will be in charge of that. And um, you know they'll let you know how to contact them if you have any trouble getting your ballot or any questions about voting. Um, so first up, we have um, for District 2, 
coordinating council. So first up is Thistle, and uh, you know we have uh, two minutes, so let's try to keep things moving. Our first speaker is in uh, 25 minutes, actually less. Go ahead, Thistle. All right, hi everyone. I live in Madison, as stated before, District 2, and um, I'm really interested in the mechanics of democracy, and I'd like to learn about policy making and be in discussions with fellow Green Party members um, on the state level and then eventually on the national level um, to better participate in civic life and also to fight the two party system, big corporations, big oil, big gas. Um, I have a lot of experience in organizing in a very grassroots way. I'm a musician. Um, I just recently wrote a song for a Georgia Green Party senator candidate um, that you know he got 15,000, he was on the, the ballot in Georgia, he got 15,000 votes. Um, so I, I love to use my songwriting talent for uh, environmental causes, causes of justice, um, indigenous solidarity, uh, clean water, and thank you so much for um, allowing me to present. Okay, thank you. So next up we have Sam Chance, also for District 2 uh, Coordinating Council. Go ahead, Sam. All right. Um, hi, I'm Sam. Um, I'm from Madison. Um, I am a uh, active member uh, in Flux Greens. Um, I'm passionate about green politics. Um, you know, I share the, the the same sort of passion that um, Fissel also expressed. Um, you know, I mean, I I put the work in. Um, I. I uh, when when there have been needs um, that have come up with with the Forex Greens, I've I've been a person who's who's stepped up in those situations, um, you know, and I'd like to do that um, uh, within the coordinating council. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really too much for for giving speeches, so I don't, you know, if this isn't the most um, inspirational thing, but. Um, yeah, I, I'd I'd really appreciate to 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 serve on the on the council and and to put that work in. Um, I'd I'd like to see uh, the state party grow. Um, I'd like to see us stronger. Um, I want you know the uh, the party to be a place which is um, safe and inclusive for for all people. Um, so that's that's what I'll say. All right, thank you, Sam. Uh, so since we are running short on time, I would like to ask if the folks who are running unopposed in districts three, four, five, and six, um, if you could just put your, um, you know, your uh, information into the chat, uh, you know, just to introduce yourself and you know, let folks know why you think you'd be a good fit for the position. Um, you know, unless there are any uh, major objections to that, you know, you can take your time if you want, but, you know, we are uh, running very short on time. Um, and Barb uh, gives a reminder that every officer has to serve on at least one committee. Uh, so with that, um, I'll invite the candidates for District 3, 4, 5, and 6 to put their information into the chat. And then for the CC at large, we've heard from Thistle and Sam. Uh, so I'd like to hear from uh, Barbara Dahlgren and then Tom Rodman. Uh, go ahead, Barbara. Hi, you all know me from being the co-chair the last two years. So I don't think I have a whole lot to say about um, my sort of governing style. Um, I figured I'd put in for this position so that I can continue to help out um, in any way that 
the um, coordinating council and the officers need me. Um, I, when I was talking about possibly helping out with the um, secretarial work, I have a bunch of boxes of stuff that could really be digitized and um, things to help keep us really transparent within our organization. So I'd be happy to help Sam um, accomplish some of that if he's uh, interested in working on the documentation for the organization in general. And um, as the, the previous co-chair, I'd be happy to um, you know keep my number open for people like Joe Nathan and, and others who, who might um, need a little support in those uh, areas. So um, thank you all for um, allowing me this chance to talk a little bit more about myself, but I think you all kind of get the idea. All right, pass. Okay, thanks Barb. Uh, so next up we have Tom Rodman. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, okay, um, so specifically we're talking about getting on the coordinating council either yep. through, yes, uh, CD4 or the at-large. Um, and then the other one is, I don't know if the alternate, yeah, the alternate delegate position at the um, national level. So I'm on a bunch of committees, IT, communications, uh, membership, platform, elections. I, I'm retired, so that, that that's the only, uh, and so I'm wearing too many hats, but nonetheless, that helps kind of bridge some of the committees. Um, also been involved in the Wisconsin campaign training school prep work, got out in the petition drive, um, uh, learned a lot about, relearned about River West neighborhood. Um, let's see, um, I it, with respect to the alternate delegate position, I'm still learning about the national committee level and I, look forward to working with Bruce Hinkforth. Uh, he's got a lot to teach on that. Um, I worked on the gubernatorial campaign uh, with Michael White and Barb and John. Um, so that's some of my background. Uh, I'm, oh, uh, a separate topic. I'm wondering if we can possibly avoid OPA vote because we might not, we might be able to resolve the conflicts, but we can look at that later, pass. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, all right, so uh, let's see. So next up we have for national committee delegates. Um, so uh, Sam, Michael, we haven't heard uh, from yet. So Sam, do you want to make your pitch for national committee delegate? Basically, I just want to be completely honest with you guys. Um, I'm not quite a member, so I'm hoping we can get that squared away. Um, just let me know uh, if I can deliver the money in person. Uh, that'd be great because I don't have a working debit card. But um, anyways, back to the point. Um, I'm, re I'm really hoping to build up the Green Party. Sorry? Yeah, I'm really hoping to build up the Green Party from the ground up. Um, like I said, I'm running for school board, so I'm hoping that we can uh, build up from the local level, and that's what, what that would be basically my main goal is uh, growth and, and ensure that uh, we become a, a very viable option. Um, I haven't really ran for any position before, so this is all kind of new to me but I'm, I'm hoping that we can make the Green Party extremely prosperous and that would be my goal is to ensure that uh, we get out there more and uh, that we're uh, well staffed. Um, I don't really have anything else to say. Okay, well, thanks a lot. So next okay. up, um, so I'm next uh, for National Committee Delegate, so I'll um, just say that, you know, I've been the co-chair of the Wisconsin Green Party uh, for a few non-consecutive terms now. Um, I have been organizing the Wisconsin Green Party and the Four Lakes Green Party since I came to Wisconsin in 2012 to work on the Jill Stein for President campaign. 
I worked on the Jill Stein campaign in 2016 as communications director. Um, and I also worked on the Lisa Savage for US Senate campaign uh, for the past year as communications director. Um, and also did some work for the Howie Hawkins campaign um, in terms of communications and fundraising. Um, so I've also been on the national platform committee. Um, I've so I've worked with the uh, Green Party at the state, local, national levels. I've uh, even been on the international level to the uh, Global Greens Congress in 2017. Um, so I'm, you know, very passionate about building the Green Party, and uh, I'm experienced uh, in it. You know, I've experience with uh, campaigns that really punched above their weight, uh, including local campaigns. Um, you know, that have won on uh, you know, shoestring budget and, you know, national campaigns that have made a big impact and really built the Green Party. Um, so um, I want to take my skills and experience to the national party um, where I think we have a lot of potential in this moment right now, as I talked about before. And um, I also have more free time now uh, since the national committee can be very time consuming and take a lot of energy uh, with very long discussions, um, but I feel like I'm prepared for it, and I hope you'll consider me. Um, so that is my two minutes. Uh, then let's see. We um, okay. So Bruce is up next for national committee delegate. Uh, go ahead, Bruce. Bruce, we can't hear you. I think Bruce said he had to step out. Um, okay, well, hopefully Bruce will be back soon. And we can, you know, hear from him soon. Um, okay, so uh, Thistle is also running for National Committee Delegate. I mean, we, we heard from Thistle on the... Uh, for the CD2, you know, is there anything that you'd like to add quickly uh, regarding the National Committee? Yeah, um, I also have a lot of time on my hands and um, feel really passionate about engaging in important conversations. And I forgot to mention that I speak Spanish. I hap happen to have a master's degree in Spanish and I taught it for a while. So that's also a good skill, I think, to have in general um, for these positions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so if Bruce is not back yet, okay, so we have Mike McAllister for National Committee Alternate. Uh, on the, uh, uh, the self-nomination form, I, I've listed a whole bunch of positions that I've, uh, uh, and offices that I've held o o over the past uh, long time. Uh, in addition, the, uh, I'd like to continue to be an alternate on the National Committee uh, to provide an eco-socialist uh, perspective to the National Committee and keep, keep the focus uh, on how we get to, uh, to fight the climate crisis and bring working people to power. Great. Thanks, Mike. All right, is Bruce back yet? Okay, sounds like Bruce is not back yet. Uh, unfortunate that he had to step out at this moment, but um, you know, hopefully he will be back soon and can make his pitch. Uh, so then, yeah, it's already 2.06 and our first speaker comes on at 2.15. So I'd like to start, um, you know, a quick discussion period. Uh, so, um, you know, anything that hasn't yet been said, uh, you know, now, and please try and keep comments brief. I'll put myself on the stack. Um, and, you know, I'll say, first of all, um, you know, in Congressional District 2 in the Four Lakes Green Party, uh, that, you know, Sam Chance has been an excellent member this year uh, has, you know, consistently showed up for meetings, has put in a lot of work, 
Uh, Sam drafted our racial justice statement, which you can find on the Wisconsin Green Party website. Um, and, you know, I really think Sam would bring a lot to the, uh, uh, to the coordinating council. And I didn't want to have to do this, but I cared too much about the Green Party to stay quiet. And when someone puts themselves forth as a candidate for leadership, we have a responsibility to honestly share information about that candidate and hold them accountable. So there has been a national conflict over the Georgia Green Party Executive Committee signing on to the so-called Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which is a backlash against the trans rights movement that seeks to deny the right of self-determination to trans folks, uh, specifically by saying that trans women are not women, they're men. And this action by a small group in Georgia has been extremely divisive in the National Party. It's given ammo to detractors of the Green Party to frame our entire National Party as transphobic and regressive. Uh, Thistle has joined the Wisconsin Green Party specifically to further this agenda, which she stated in her self-nomination. Uh, she has made herself a pariah in Madison area progressive community through her trans exclusionary agenda. She antagonizes people and groups with this advocacy, then portrays herself as a victim when she's no longer welcomed in, in those spaces. Uh, her participation in the Four Lakes Green Party has been very sporadic since joining earlier this year. Um, and her only other initiative has been signing us up to create a Black Lives Matter mural on State Street which she then didn't follow through with. Uh, so it just was left empty saying, you know, reserve for Four Lakes Green Party. And she also attempted to misrepresent correspondence with Barb Dahlgren to try to bend the rules so that Carrie Bruss could join the Four Lakes Green Party to support Thistle's agenda. She's disrespected other Greens, refused to call trans folks by their pronouns. She insists that trans women are not women, they're men. And she's called the trans rights movement sinister, parasitic, and blood-sucking. So Thistle has been very disruptive and divisive in her short time in the Green Party. She's a bridge burner. Putting Thistle in any type of leadership position would alienate Greens and progressives in Madison, in Wisconsin, and nationally, and create major problems when we otherwise have huge opportunities to move forward united. So therefore, I will not be ranking Thistle for any positions whatsoever. I encourage others to do the same. Um, you know, we need strong, united leadership. And uh, with that, I will pass. OK, so uh, I was not able to keep track of who's on the stack. Barb, are you able to, um, to uh, take stack? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find where the last um, stack was, hang on, <laughs> um, to try and get to the top of it. Um, I believe Thistle is first, and then Tomas, and then Bill, and then, I'll, and then Melissa. OK, so first okay. Thistle. Yeah, um, it's true that I haven't gone to many Four Lakes uh, Green Party meetings. I've had a conflict with an herbalism course that I've been taking. Um, but I've I collected signatures for the Howie Hawkins Angela um, Walker campaign, and I think that there's been a lot of um, defamation and slander against me because. Um, I am a radical feminist, and I think that 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 needs to be taken into consideration. That David is, or that Dave is framing this in a way that is defamatory, and that that goes against our, you know, it's like that's why um, Carrie and I have been concerned about using terms like bad actor or you know, um, gross misconduct. And it's because we disagree um, with uh, we, we disagree with transgender politics and transgender ideology because we're in favor of women's sex-based sex rights, which the Georgia Green Party has ratified and endorsed the declaration, the International Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights. 
and you know it's a document that it makes sure that that girls and women um, for example, in sports are competing against girls and women and not competing against males. So there are lots of reasons to support women and girls sex based rights. That's just one of the, the reasons. Um, there's also children's rights that are involved with this issue. Um, so I would just encourage you to do your research, um, you know, do a Google search on the defamation campaigns that have been happening against radical feminists and also look at the difference between um, you know, what radical feminists are saying about transgender activism and transgender politics and what uh, trans activists are saying about radical feminists and then make a decision. I'm, I'm here to serve. I wanna be a part, I wanna be included. And I feel like you know, what Dave just did is excluding me, um, especially considering our, our differential him being in the Green Party so much longer than I have been and his positions of power in the Green Party and him being a white male above me in that sense of the, the term too, getting back to what Barb was saying about protecting classes of people. Women are discriminated against on the basis of sex. Women are systematically excluded from public life and um, you know, political life because we we have because of opinions that we we may hold and women have the right to be in public and to be a part of public discourse and to express dissenting views so thank you thank you okay so as barb just pointed out in the chat we have to stop discussion right at 2 15 sherry honkala has joined us so um People can continue the discussion in the chat, but you know we have a have a tight schedule with our guest speakers, so um, you know. So it sounds like I have two minutes for my stack comment, right? <laughs> you you've got two minutes. If you can keep it shorter, that'd be great. Sure, no yeah. problem. Hey, I'm I'm glad we're having this discussion. I'll go ahead and go on record and say I um, am an advocate for women's sex-based rights. Um, and I think that there are times when um, transgender rights are at odds with that. I don't think this, I think as Greens, we want to um, we want to go with what we do agree on, which is anti-militarism, ecological wisdom. I'm hoping we can use those things as our uh, basis for movement forward in solidarity pass. Okay, um, so we have one more minute. Um, I think we had one other person on the stack. Um, Barb, who was it? Bill, go ahead, Bill. I can't do it in a minute, but just let me say that I agree very strongly with Dave and I disagree very strongly with Carrie Thistle and Tomas. Although I will note that Carrie has been extremely uh, respectful and supportive, and, and has been a good um, activist in our uh, in our chapter in um, Milwaukee so far. I think I still have several seconds left, so I'd like to say something on behalf of, of Barb Barbara uh, Dahlgren and Tom Rodman for whatever they happen to run for. I can't even see what they're on the ballot for, but um, uh, they collected between the two of them close to half of all the signatures that were collected this summer. Um, Barb reminds me of me when I was in my 20s. I'm no longer in my 20s. I had the same drive, determinism, determin uh, determination and activism that she's demonstrated and she needs to be in the leadership someplace. Same for Tom, pass. Thomas. Okay. Thanks. We can keep the discussion going in the chat, but now Sherry Hockel has joined us. Uh, so, um, and we'll have Howie Hawkins joining us at 2.30. So um, we now have some time for Sherry to speak. And, um, you know, if, if you have, we might uh, be able to get to a, a question or two. So if you have any questions for Sherry, please, um, you know, share them with me and Barb and uh, you know, we'll be moderating the Q any Q&A. Uh, so 
Without further ado, Sherry Honkla is our 2012 Green Party Vice Presidential Candidate and National Coordinator of the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. Uh, welcome, Sherry. Hi. Um, hello, Wisconsin. <laughs> How's the weather? <laughs> it's been like 70 oh, degrees on and off here. Um, first of all, I want to, um, I don't know if they're here right now, but I, I uh, definitely want to acknowledge uh, Angela Walker uh, from your wonderful state who stepped forward and um, uh, played the, the thankless role of VP, something I have experience with doing, uh, but it's a very important thing. Uh, and I think that she did um, an amazing job uh, being a, a working class person uh, and having to hold down a job and um, have to deal with, you know, all of the Zooms and speaking engagements and all of those kinds of things. Um, I just really, really want to say um, thank you for playing that role in the party. Um, I also... Um, have been asked to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the work that I'm engaged in and basically how I approach um, my life as a green. And, and um, you know, the Kermit the Frog thing, you know, it ain't easy being green. <laughs> Boy, did I learn that after, uh, you know, running for various different political offices, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, this last year and um, around this election uh, was just very toxic and hard. And um, I'm very proud uh, to be a part of a political party that doesn't take money from the bad guys, doesn't take money from the corporations. And um, I have really continued to um, instill those kinds of uh, values and morals into the organizing work that I do, not just in Philadelphia, but around the country in the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. And one of the things that um, I have been doing is um, there was uh, another, um, uh, you know, we were doing a lot of organizing here in Biden country. Um, Biden decided to put his national headquarters in Philadelphia. So that made it very difficult, um, mostly because everybody from various different um, nonprofits, no matter what they were working on, there was a lot of money going around. Um, so a lot of the soft Democratic Party money uh, for specifically for like social media, for organizing, for music. Um, you know, if you were a Biden person, you could get a lot of money for organizing this last year. And there was a super abundance. And I live in the, you know, the belly of the beast here in Philadelphia because this is where his headquarters were. So here I am running around Philadelphia doing organizing. <laughs> Uh, where Biden's got his, you know, national office. So of course, you know, as a, a, a good green, uh, we organized the Lives Over Luxury March uh, during the pandemic um, and uh, March to uh, Biden's office. We've had to, um, we've seen, um, you know, many organizations and different individuals that are engaged in this kind of anti-poverty work um, who were like putting up testimonials about like, I've never voted as a Democrat in my life, but I, I have to vote for Biden uh, because, you know, because <laughs> somehow he's different uh, than, um, you know, both of the two similar corporate political parties. Um, so it was a very, it's been a very strange um, experience organizing. And it, I think it's gonna be very interesting as days go ahead when many of those organizers uh, took Biden money, 
gave testimonials and now are not going to have that Biden money under the auspices of, you know, getting people out to vote for Biden uh, to do their organizing work. Um, and especially if uh, we continue to see problems with poverty, hunger, unemployment, the climate, um, and everything else, not just in this country, but around the world. Um, and so um, I know in my work uh, in September, over 6 million people couldn't pay their rent. So um, we've had to, out of necessity, um, you, know, uh, you know, be frontline organizers and workers. Uh, we haven't been able to afford to just, you know, various different problems by being online and having Zoom conversations. Um, and, uh, you know, I was one of the people that got um, COVID-19 and I was hospitalized. Um, but we had, we had and we have no choice um, with record numbers of people that are physically being thrown out, thrown out onto the streets. Um, some of the homeless organizing work, um, you know, uh, was not being talked about again because of the suppression of the, the media, because this being, you know, Biden had his headquarters where homeless people were living outside, um, you know, about 12 blocks from his national headquarters. Um, but so uh, the crisis in this country has taken us out literally onto the street um, and we formed what we call the poor people's army and it's the army for humanity um, and demanding that um, you know they bring the domestic dollars um, that they spend on war and take that money and bring it back home and so um, we have been knowing that you know we're the poor people's army but pretty much everybody in the poor people's army uh, sees themselves as an independent or a green. Um, you know, people are very clear that we're definitely not the people on the Biden payrolls or the corporations or the banks. Uh, and so what we've been doing is um, we've been moving families. We've been doing it for 30 years, but never in this kind of record numbers. Um, we've been moving homeless families into abandoned government-owned properties out of necessity uh, because they can't go into the shelters. The shelters, 50% um, uh, of the male shelters here, um, you know, people all had, 50% had COVID um, and they're no longer, uh, doctors stepped forward and said it would be better for people to live outside um, as opposed to um, go into the shelters uh, and get sick from COVID. So, um, you know, we've been taking matters into our own hands and people visibly know that I'm a green and I work with other greens um, as a part of the Poor People's Army, kind of taking a page out of history from the Black Panther Party in which um, every day, every single day, while the Democrats um, uh, have an entire apparatus of food that's distributed through the churches and through political allegiance to the Democratic Party, we've begun to identify uh, people that want to be separate of the Democratic Party and separate of corporations. Um, and so we are uh, developing food bases and mutual aid centers across the entire city um, as we take over abandoned government owned properties to house people. Um, and then of course we're providing, um, you know, in those houses we're providing political education uh, and talking about why people are poor in the first place, uh, why people are homeless in a country that has more abandoned properties than they do homeless mm. people. Uh, and providing the necessary kind of political education. And now um, I know on um, Wednesday this week, we're doing a, a training for Baltimore 
Um, we're doing them for, you know, Texas, California, um, uh, Minnesota, uh, you name it, we're doing for it for people across the entire country um, because people are having to move away from just having conversations and figuring out how they're gonna deal with the millions of new people um, that are ending up on our streets um, because they haven't been able to uh, pay for the basic necessities of life. And because we live in a country that doesn't have, um, uh, you know, a, a system that's set up to, um, you know, keep families in decent, accessible, affordable housing uh, during a pandemic. So, um, you know, we, we look forward um, to uh, continuing to uh, work with, uh, as Greens, um, with other Greens across the entire country uh, to develop the kind of infrastructure that really supports our, our ideas and our values um, and takes us away from just like talking about our values and actually living them out on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, I will, <laughs> I actually made a timer for myself. <laughs> I will shut thank up you. for a moment. <laughs> so thank you guys. Um, we desperately need people to lift up our work that's taking place right now. At any given moment, um, things could get really bad. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, um, we appreciate you joining us. And um, yeah, uh, so if, if folks can, uh, you know, we want to pass the hat virtually for the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. You know, Sherry and her comrades do awesome work. And uh, I, th I think, um, you know, Barb has shared that link, so maybe we can share it again. Um, and we have time for one question for you, Sherry. Um, and it's a good one. So uh, the question is, the Green Party itself is a working class party that, oh, okay, sorry, it keeps bumping me out of the chat. So the Green Party itself is a working class party that's competing with full-time workers and other parties as volunteers has led to a lot of burnout. How do you see the party moving forward to economically support itself in a more sustainable way? Well, I think the first thing is, um, uh, I think that when you're on the right road, you don't get burned out. Um, and I had to really learn that I think the hard way over time, um, because I felt like for many years I was on the treadmill and I wasn't going anywhere. And um, when I, finally learned that just because you get a bunch of different people in the room that say that they represent different organizations doesn't necessarily mean that you're on the same road. But when I began to uh, become a critical thinker and really understand who really um, supports and is um, aligned with independent politics and doesn't take money from corporations and I, pulled back the, the curtain, um, then I became energized at finding out um, who are the different people that are doing like work and have the same kind of vision for the same kind of world. Um, because the people that have been the most giving in the work that I've done over all of these years are people that have nothing. Um, and it's the people that have nothing uh, that have continuously refuse to take money um, from the corporations and from the banks uh, to do their work. And um, so uh, that would be my answer. If you're on the right path, you get up every day with a hop and a skip uh, because, you know, I feel good every day. I mean, I, you know, physically it's hard on my bones. Uh, because uh, I feel like I'm a full-time mover, but every night I go to bed and I go to bed sound and I feel good about myself inside and out because every day I know as a green 
I'm not just talking about my visions of a new world and my policies and da da da. da. I'm helping to feed, clothe, and house people each and every day and helping to develop other generals and political leaders in this process. And those things are inseparably connected to each other. And I think we have to move away from trying to get the liberal left in the room and then beg them to do the right thing. I think we need to do less talking and more, more working and we'll sleep better and we won't be so tired and we won't be burnt out and we'll love each other. That's my few words. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry. Yeah, um, awesome. Well, we really appreciate your work and we appreciate Thank you joining you us. I, I've got one last quick question for Sherry. Can anybody around the country join the Poor People's Army or just people in your local area? Actually, um, we are trying to start divisions of the Poor People's Army across the entire country. Um, and so if you wanna get three or four people together on you know whatever part of the country or whatever, uh, then we can help you do that. Um, but we're very clear that um, we will not take any money from banks. We will not take any money from corporations. And um, you know, we want we want to change the world. And we're we're done just talking about it. And now we're in a situation in this country where we can't just put forward policy ideas. Um, we've got to help people stay alive. And I think why not Greens take the lead in that? Thank you so much, Sherry. You guys are awesome. Have a beautiful day. Howie, thank you for your work this last year and running for president. Okay, bye. Bye, thank you. I right, thanks, Sherry. Thank you, guys. Uh, all right, so our next, uh, our next speaker, we're very excited to have him here, uh, is a co-founder of the Green Party US, um, a longtime champion for the Green Party and all the causes that we stand for, uh, has been involved in countless social movements, has run for office many times, from you know local city council to the presidency and um, has also written an excellent free short ebook uh, on building an independent left party from the bottom up that I highly recommend everyone should read. Um, so with no further ado, let's welcome Howie Hawkins. Howie, you're up. You might be on mute. Yeah, he's on mute. <laughs> hey, everybody, how you doing? Uh, first of all, you know, I just want to thank you all for going out, getting a petition, and the Democratic Party broke the law to get us off the ballot. Um, I've been talking to a lawyer. He's a Democrat. He can practice in Wisconsin. He's doing election protection now, but he thinks we are done wrong. So unless you guys object, we want to sue for damages. Like maybe they give us our ballot line. Maybe they pay for the petition. Uh, or at least we point out what the Democrats did. Uh, I, I think the difference in Wisconsin, it's harder to make the argument that the Democrats can crow that Biden won because we were knocked off the ballot. Um, he's ahead by what now? about 40,000 votes. Jill got 31,000 votes uh, in 2016. They are making that argument in Pennsylvania and they're you know, slapping themselves on the back, the Democrats, because they think because we were not on the ballot, Biden won. And we know from like 2016 exit polls, 61% of Jill Stein's voters would have stayed home. We bring new voters to the polls, so suppressing the Green Party is suppressing voters. And I think that's something we need to raise going forward. Um, I don't think we should beat ourselves up. It was a tough year, but we have to understand that we were in a larger dynamic. We didn't have much control over. This was a referendum on Trump and Biden was not Trump. 
the issues we tried to raise about the climate with the Green New Deal, about economic inequality with the Economic Bill of Rights, with the new nuclear arms race, with our peace initiatives, they weren't discussed. This was not a campaign about issues. So it's very difficult for us to get a word in edgewise. Certainly, we were blanked out in the corporate media. Um, although I have to say, we're something of a phenomenon right now on TikTok with teenagers and 20-somethings. I mean, they put stuff out from our campaign that have got upwards of 2 million views. And Angela and I are getting all kinds of encouragement to keep going from these young folks. So I think that's one bright spot. And then you know about Emmanuel Estrada and Franca Mother Paz and Lisa Savage. We ran a lot of good campaigns and I think that's what we need to focus on now. Uh, my campaign is filed again for 2024, not because I'm running. I don't, I don't have any idea whether I should, but we wanna keep raising and spending money on political organizing, which a political committee can do. And we wanna help uh, local green parties get better organized and learn how to really organize and, and organize a mass base, not just mobilize the usual suspects. We wanna help greens elect local candidates you know, we've, we've elected over 1,200 over the years. We have over 100 in office now. That should be in the thousands. And that's the foundation for getting in state legislatures in Congress. When we have a caucus of Greens in Congress, we run a presidential ticket, it'll be hard to ignore. So uh, we wanna help get ballot access. I mean, we're putting together a plan. We can start now for 2022 and 2024 and uh, that's one priority. We want to engage in some issue campaigns. Uh, one I'm particularly interested in doing is abolish the Electoral College and go for a national popular vote with ranked choice voting. There's a bill in Congress for just national popular vote, but not with ranked choice voting. And I've, I've been working with uh, Rob Ritchie at Fair Vote to see what we might could do about that, as well as push the Fair Representation Act, which would create proportional representation in Congress by having ranked choice voting for multi-member districts. And you can look that bill up, it's called the Fair Representation Act. One of the bright spots of the election is Albany, California passed a bill to have ranked choice voting, all the candidates are at large, which means they're gonna have proportional representation in that city. Cambridge, Massachusetts has had it since the progressive era, but it's been the only one. Now we got two. So I think that's something. And the good thing about ranked choice voting is while we can raise it as a national demand, we can push it in our cities and counties. I don't know what the number is after the election, going into the election, we had it in 23 cities and counties and now the state of Maine. We lost in Massachusetts and Alaska, but uh, we can come back. I just think that's one issue that for us is important because we're always going to be called the spoilers and we got a solution to that. And this is a way we can build a broader coalition and uh, deal with that issue. So uh, I think another thing that we need to understand is that it wasn't just the green left that got clobbered. It was the whole damn left because our radical intelligentsia, the prominent personalities and socialists with their open letters. I mean, this year they didn't advocate safe states. They advocated 100% Biden, Biden everywhere. And then, you know, they closed ranks behind Biden after the Democratic establishment closed ranks against Bernie Sanders. So they made no demands on the Biden campaign. They made no public campaign for progressive changes in the general election, at least in the presidential election. Which means the guy that had an economic message was Trump. I mean, it was full of lies, but he talked about it. And if you look at the exit polls, for Trump voters, the economy was their top issue. And the Democratic Party, which is a party ideologically of the professional managerial class, right? They don't have an economic program for working class people. It's meritocracy. And they talk about, you know, breaking down barriers for different groups that have 
they're marginalized historically, but it's not, it's about formal equality, not substantive equality. So a lot of these working class people that voted for Trump, and actually more black people, more everybody voted for Trump than actually white men who went down a little bit, 2%. So the Democrats left that field open. It was the Clinton campaign that they lost to Trump all over again. So there's a vacuum there. And I think as we do local organizing, you know, we want to go to working class people, people of color and the youth who vote in low numbers are disgusted with the two parties. But I think we also got to find a way to have conversations with, you know, white working class people in, you know, Trump districts and talk about, you know, how we can deal with these problems they're facing, you know, which is evictions, loss of jobs, the opioid epidemic. The Democrats got no solution for that. There's a vacuum there that we can fill. So, you know, what we, we want to keep doing is organizing and, you know, helping people improve their skills, improve their strategic orientation, and uh, elect a lot of people to local office and make that a foundation for getting a stronger foothold in the political system. And the, the last thing I'll say, and then I guess we do question and answers is, um, there may be a recount in Wisconsin. I've been working with Lynn Serpy to see where Greens might observe recounts. We put out a call to Georgia. We don't have a strong party there. Didn't get much of a response. That recount's ongoing. As we understand it, you have an automatic recount if it's uh, less than 1% difference. Right now it's 1.7%. So there may not be a recount in, in Wisconsin, but uh, we may send you all a message just to, you know, what to know, when to be ready. I think it's November 17th, which isn't that far away that we'll know if uh, they're going to do a recount there. But that's a good opportunity to exercise our election protection mus muscles, to understand how recounts work, because some of us may be in recounts in the future, and also to make sure our write-ins get counted. I know we can't cover the whole state. You got a hell of a lot of jurisdictions, I know. But, you know, if some of us do it and report to others what they learned, uh, that would probably be beneficial. So that's all I got. You got questions or what's next? All right. So um, people are asking about the Q&A. So it looks like folks have some questions for you. Um, yeah, so if people wanna put their questions in the chat, then Barb and I can pull them up. Um, so while they're composing their questions, I just wanna ask, you know, Howie, for people who want to, uh, you know, keep organizing, keep building with you and Angela uh, in the campaign, because I know you're you know, continuing your work, you're continuing to organize the Green Party from the bottom up. Um, you know, what's a good way for people to, you know, stay in touch with you and stay involved? If you're not already signed up as a volunteer with the campaign website, do that. And we're, you know, getting things together. We're going to have some kind of way for people to have horizontal communications and discussions, you know, of people that supported the campaign. And we're still working out, but it probably involves Zoom calls and some kind of platform where people can send emails to each other or, you know, base camp messages to each other and share information and ideas. And uh, the other thing we want to do is uh, be in touch with some of these socialist groups that supported us, some DSA local chapters, Socialist Party, Independent Socialist Group, Socialist Alternative. I'm not sure how much they really believe what they say about we need to build a mass party. It needs to be bigger than any of us, but uh, we're gonna continue those discussions and uh, that'll probably be worked out state by state. The Greens are everywhere pretty much. These socialist groups are here and there. So yeah, I think that's something that has to be worked out state by state. But anyway, we're gonna set up a way for uh, people to get involved in these discussions and, uh, 
you know, share experiences and ideas and maybe work together on issue campaigns. Great. All right. So uh, I see a question from uh, Patty, which is how can we tap into your help and resources to grow the Wisconsin Green Party? And a reminder to other people uh, to put your questions into the chat so Barbara and I can get them to Howie. Uh, yeah, so the question, one more time, how can we tap into your help and resources to grow the Wisconsin Green Party? Ask. I mean, we're gonna put together materials on organizing, on running local campaigns. We wanna do some popular materials for political education, like why are we politically independent? What do we mean by eco-socialism? Uh, around some policy issues. I mean, the way this campaign unfolded, we were in 47 primaries and we finally got the nomination on July 11th. And then we had a mad, mad scramble for ballot access. So we have stuff in the works on tax reform, on what part of the military budget we can cut to get to a 75% reduction, a whole media reform platform, education policy. So we want to keep rolling these out at timely moments uh, when they might you know, make a difference, at least within the movements. Uh, I'm not sure the corporate media is going to pay us any attention, although we'll keep trying. So that's kind of what we're doing now in the next couple of months. But if you have you know, specific needs that you think we might be able to you know, help with resources, people, you know, state them and, you know, we'll do the best we can to help. Um, the next question is from Sam. Um, the question is, how do we leverage over the Democrats and Republicans to achieve our agenda? What is the carrot and what's the stick? Well, the stick is we take votes from them. I mean, the Democrats pay us no mind we can do all the protests in the street we want. Look at the protests against the war in Iraq, which both parties supported. But because, particularly in 2004, after the war got started, most of the peace movement lined up behind Kerry, who was actually pro-war. They took us for granted. We got to run our own candidates. That's, if we start taking votes, then they're going to listen. I mean, I've used this example a lot, but when I got 5% running against Andrew Cuomo in 2014, in a year when all the media reports were, he wanted to run up the vote to get ready to run for president, get more than his daddy, Mario Cuomo, ever got as governor, get more than he got in 2010 when he was first elected, and he got less. And we're sitting there with 5% of the vote. So to compete for our voters, he had to adopt policies he had not supported before, like a ban on fracking and a $15 minimum wage. That's our leverage. And I think the other thing is when we're in movements, we shouldn't call defeats victories. You hear a lot of happy talk, you know, from the Sunrise Movement, 350.org, et cetera, say on climate, when Biden is terrible on climate. And, you know, they put all their eggs in the basket of Biden and Biden owes them nothing. The role of a movement is to make demands for real solutions. I mean, the example I like is the anti-Vietnam War movement. In 68, we put our demands on Humphrey and Nixon. We didn't say Humphrey was a lesser evil. We put them on uh, Kennedy and, and uh, McCarthy because they weren't for out now, they were for negotiations now. And in the aftermath, Nixon won, but by 1970, him and Kissinger realized because of the mass opposition that they couldn't carry out their secret plan to end the war, which was to use tactical nukes in North Vietnam. That's how you, you get anybody in office to uh, respond when the, when the movement gets big enough and you clear on your demands and you don't compromise. So in the movement work, I think you know, our role is to not accept compromises. And uh, you know, I think you know, we have a role to play both in the climate movement and you know, Black Lives Matter. My perception of that movement is they're kind of settling for what the Democrats are willing to do, which is use of force reforms for the most part. But that leaves the police in charge of policing themselves. 
And, you know, we had a ban on chokeholds in New York City in 1993. In 2013, Eric Garner was killed by a chokehold. And the officer that did that got no sanctions from the department internally. So that's an example where we can raise the demand of community control for the police. And, uh, you know, the broader movement may not accept it, but, or adopt it in terms of dealing with their local communities, but, you know, that's where we can bring it into an election campaign and, and get a real debate on it. Cool, thanks. Uh, we have a lot of great questions coming in for you. So we'll try to uh, go through them quickly. Um, so Tom asks, how, we, how do we identify leaders? How do we recruit them? Well, I think what you got to do is what organizers do. They, they go out and they listen. They talk to people and they listen and find out what's on their minds, what are their issues, and then find a way to work with them on that basis. I mean, our tendency is, you know, we got the 10 key values, we got a Green New Deal, whatever it is, and preach. But if we don't have a relationship, then people are like, well, you know, who the hell are you? Um, so I think now identifying leaders is you, if you, if you like uh, knock doors on a block, you're going to find, you know, big mama of the block. You know, there's a woman that kind of looks after all the kids everybody looks to, everybody asks what's going on. You find the same thing in workplaces, informal leaders that, you know, people kind of look to, like, what are they thinking? And so that's one thing you need to identify as, a, as an organizer, because those are the people you want to be working with, because they have influence. I mean, there's a lot to say on that, but that's, that's the beginning of that discussion. Okay. okay. The next question is from Bruce Hinkforth. Howie, what is your position on making a GPUS, making the GPUS a membership organization instead of its current structure? Well, I, I've been for that forever. And I haven't pushed it at the national level because the national structure is so dysfunctional, you can't even get a real discussion. And representatives, I find a lot of people doing a lot at the national level are doing nothing locally. I don't even know who the hell they're representing. I think we need to look to Canada, which has you know, got a foothold in their parliament, elected a lot of people to their provincial legislatures. They're a membership party. They have some resources and they have a living, breathing membership. You know who the members are. You know, our basis of representation in the National Committee and Conventions is a whole very complicated formula. How many candidates they run? How many votes did they get? How many petitions did they get? I mean, they're like 30 categories. So you get the anomalies like Texas had gave up when they lost their ballot line. But because in the election in which they lost their ballot line, they got a lot of votes. It's a big state. So their number of representatives increased in a moment when they had no party. It didn't make any sense. Now the Republicans gave them back their party by legislation and they came back to life. But, you know, that's an example. I think we need to think about having just for the purposes of democracy, uh, one member, one vote. So we need a membership. And now how we get there, I think the way to push it is to have locals and state parties do it and make it work. And we'll know when we can pass it at the national level because, you know, majority of the state parties will be doing it. I don't see much, and the other people can try, but I'm, I'm not interested in putting a proposal to a national committee that I don't even know who they're representing. And, you know, I know there are people there that will object and I just don't see that as a fruitful thing. I think we got to do that from the bottom up. All right, thanks, Howie. So our next question is from Patty. How can we motivate the Gen Ys and Gen Zs to become engaged and activists for us? Okay, Gen Y, what, what age is that? That's like 30s or is that 20s? Yeah, I'm not sure. Do you mean millennials? No, I think that's older. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the Gen Ys would be like the millennials and the Gen uh, Zs are the younger ones, like up to age 23. Okay, well, the millennials we know from polling are the most progressive cohort in the country um, and from voting behavior. So I think, you know, the way to recruit them is to have 
organizations, local parties that look like they're getting something done and are effective and are, you know, fun to participate in or fruitful to participate in. The Gen Z, all I know is that Angela and I are getting scores of messages from teenagers and, and people in their young 20s pleading with us to keep going, to run again. They want to vote for us because they'll be able to vote next time for the younger ones. And they put stuff on TikTok, which I don't have much of a feel for, but I'm told some of their posts about our campaign have got upwards of 2 million views and a lot of them in the hundreds of thousands. There's definitely, we did strike a chord with those real young folks. And uh, so we just had a campaign team meeting figuring out how we can get them engaged. And uh, we got some ideas that uh, I think we're gonna have to have a discussion next week because we had a long meeting and in the end didn't really have anybody take responsibility for that, but a lot of good ideas. So. I think the Gen Z kids are, look, they're fighting for their futures, their climate. They want racial justice. They don't have good economic prospects. They want economic justice and they want real solutions. I mean, sometimes young folks just got a clearer picture. They haven't you know, been defeated a bunch of times or made compromises and they wanted what we were talking about. And I think one of the ironies of the campaign is talk about the Green New Deal Medicare for all, tuition-free public college, legal marijuana, go through our whole program. Our platform was much more popular than Trump and Biden. You know, the terrible thing about the campaign is the dynamic was a referendum on Trump. And it just, we couldn't get a word in edgewise. In the, you know, traditional media, in the social media, the kids found us and they, they were excited. Awesome. So Howie, we only have a couple minutes left, but we still have a couple of great questions. So if we could try to do them real quick, but I want to get to them. So Eric asks, can I ask Howie about the need to create new media to promote the Greens, since the corporate media is content to ignore or defame us? Well, we talk about social media. I think we also need, like we used to have, a newspaper that will be online, but also we can print out locally and distribute, it's physical. I think we need a literature of, you know, very readable uh, leaflets on issues, on what the Green Party's about, and, you know, an organized way of distributing that. Uh, so that's kind of traditional print media, which is really taking a beating in this environment, but we distributed it to grassroots. And of course, social media, you know, that's where a lot of people can, find us if they want to. Cool, all right. So then Bill asks, what are your ideas for strengthening the National Green Party? Uh, strengthen the grassroots. And then, you know, they'll take care of the National Party. I, I have a lot of ideas. I mean, just one. We shouldn't have a steering committee that's both has administrative responsibilities and national spokesperson responsibilities especially with nine of them. I mean, it just can't work. You need an administrative committee. You need a chair or co-chairs to speak for the party. And then I would say the working groups that we have, particularly those where every state party gets to put three people on it, that just doesn't function. You should elect a leadership in the administrative committee and they can co-op people on the committees like ballot access, for example, and if people aren't doing it work, you replace them. Um, that's a big subject, but that's, I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Well, I'm sure we could continue this conversation for hours, um, but you've got places to go and we've got other speakers. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm, gonna thanks. Around, I'm gonna hang around for the next hour. Awesome. I'm, I'm on a listening tour myself, hearing what Green is <laughs> saying. And seeing where we're at that that's awesome great well um then uh i will just introduce our next guest uh who uh it gives me very great pleasure to introduce um because i've gotten to know her over the past year uh and it's been an amazing experience uh lisa savage is a 
you know, longtime activist, a public school teacher, a, uh, you know, former union negotiator, a uh, former small business owner. Uh, she's a mother, grandmother, uh, and she was the independent green candidate for a U.S. Senator in Maine's ranked choice voting election. Um, and full disclosure, I had the pleasure of serving as her communications director over the past year. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lisa Savage. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Howie, and thanks, everyone who's here. It's great to be here. I'm speaking to you from Seoul in Maine. I'm up here in the woods again. I had to move a little bit because my internet access at the time was not very good, but we've made some fixes, and I think I'll be able to get through a Zoom from my actual home here in the second district in Maine. So maybe I'm going to back way back to more than a year ago to a press conference that I called, uh, helped organize for a conversion campaign I'd been part of here in Maine, coalition of many uh, uh, environmental groups and also um, pushing back on militarism, anti-war groups, peace groups, that were waging a campaign to convert our weapons manufacturer, Maine's biggest employer, Bath Iron Works, owned by General Dynamics, and have it stop building warships for the Navy, which is all it builds, and have it instead build um, clean energy systems or a, a public transportation like light rail, passenger rail that we don't have here in Maine. And um, so I had been on that campaign for some time and I was always like the press person. I would put my, I would write the press releases and put them out with my contact info on them. And we had a press conference in Portland, Maine. This is before, long before COVID. So this is in the uh, late spring, almost summertime of 2019. And um, I, some of our local greens here in Maine had come to that, as well as uh, many other speakers. So we had some indigenous uh, speakers, we had some water justice speakers, and we were all talking about this, uh, the, the climate crisis, how it was a true emergency and what could be done about it. And one of the greens here in Maine, Justin uh, Beth, had uh, seen me a few days earlier and I knew he was coming and he said, how would you like to have Jill Stein speak at your press conference? I said, wow, that would be amazing. Um, you know, are, are you inviting her? And he said, yes, I will. So in fact, Jill came up and spoke to uh, climate, you know, to a Green New Deal and what that could look like in Maine and met some people and so forth. And then um, a bunch of us the next day went to Bath Ironworks and committed an act of civil resistance and were arrested. I think that was the fourth time I've been arrested there. Um, uh, because they were holding a christening, a celebration for their latest warship. So that's kind of where I was coming from. I was still working full time as a teacher in public schools here near where I live. Um, but a little later in that summer, a couple of uh, green national greens uh, contacted me and said, hey, your Senate race is the one to watch because Susan Collins is super unpopular and you guys have ranked choice voting now. What would you consider running? Your name keeps coming up when we say, you know, who would be a good person to uh, put the real Green New Deal, the Green New Green New Deal in front of voters and really embody that and, and bring that along as a project. So that was not something I was planning to do. I was going to teach one more year at that point. Uh, I was going to teach two more years at that point. This is summer of 2019. But it was one of those summers when everyone came to Maine, it was pre-COVID, all my grown-up kids came back with their families, my uncle came, my sisters, and I had a chance to talk to many people that know me well, and to a person, they were like, yeah, this is perfect for you. We didn't know what you were going to do after teaching. Go for it. This will be great. So with their support and with strong, you know, and with green saying, we've got your back. I was, I was a green at the time. My husband had been a green since forever. I think he's been blamed for every Republican administration since the first Ronald Reagan administration. He's never, ever accepted that whole spoiler argument. He's like, fuck that. I'm voting for who I think would be good. I'm not compromising and voting lesser of two evils. Sorry. I admit I had been a lesser than two evil voter at times. I had been a Democrat at times. And, um, uh, early on when Obama got nominated and completely blew it in the Senate, voting for the war supplemental and giving, you know, the telecoms immunity from spying on us. I was like, I'm done. I'm green now. 
So going into it, I was a green. So I sought ballot access as a green. Well, here in Maine, we may have ranked choice voting, but boy, do they have the system stacked against third parties getting on the ballot. So the rules were we could start January 1st. We had until March 15th to gather 2,000 registered green signatures. Now on the books, there were 40,000 or more registered greens, but it was a Super Tuesday primary that year, which Maine doesn't usually have, but we did last year. And uh, many people had switched to Democrat because they wanted to vote for Bernie in the primary. Many green leaning people had done that. And also many people had registered green and then who knew where they were? They weren't at their last known address. Maine's a very big state geographically. So we started at the stroke of midnight on January 1st and we put pedal to the metal for uh, about two months solid, January and February. And we were averaging, we had put in 900 hours of both volunteer and some paid uh, gatherers toward the end. And we had only gathered 900 of those 2000 signatures that we needed. And we realized like, we're looking for a needle in a haystack and we're doing it in ice storm season. You know, one of our big volunteers, Bruce Gagnon, literally slipped on ice at the top of some stairs and fell all the way down the stairs and ended up in the emergency room. Um, it was not a good time of year to be canvassing in Maine. So uh, we had hired a ballot access coordinator named Isaac Schattenberg out of Massachusetts that had worked on the ranked choice voting campaigns here in Maine, had some familiarity with Maine and his name, you know, kind of popped up. And so Isaac said, Lisa, I hate to break it to you. You're going to have to unenroll as a green if you want me to get you on the ballot. And I was like, but I, that would be disloyal. I can't do that. These, you know, people have brought me so far. They've worked so hard. He was like, I'm telling you, if you unenroll and run as an independent, it's just a bureaucratic thing. You don't have to change your platform. You don't have to stop being green in your heart, green in your values and your issues. But if we run you as an unenroll, this is what it's called in Maine, but essentially independent, we need 4,000 signatures, so twice as many, but we can get them from any registered voter. And I believe we can get all the signatures we need in one day like, come on, Isaac, we've been at this for how many days? And we, he's like, no, Super Tuesday. We stand outside the biggest polls and anyone emerging is a registered voter because they just voted in the primary and we gather their signature. Well, turned out he was right. And because we had overbuilt so much during the very difficult green access period, we ended up getting more than 9,000 signatures in that one day. Um, and so we only needed 4,000, you know, verifiable ones. Then the pandemic hit almost immediately. So then most of our signatures were in city clerk's offices somewhere. And Portland in particular, Portland is the biggest city in Maine. We had maybe 5,000 some odd signatures from Portland. They shut down early and they did not open for uh, months. So they were processing nothing. In the end, we applied for ballot uh, access with no signatures from Maine's biggest city because we had enough without them. And we were like, well, I guess we should like, go ahead and do it. Um, and so we did indeed um, gain ballot access using that maneuver. Um, my platform always had been a real Green New Deal, you know, Howie Hawkins, Jill Stein Green New Deal, not that watery version that Democrats like to promote and pretend like that's a Green New Deal. So I like to call it a demilitarized Green New Deal because I know that, one, we're not cutting our carbon emissions significantly unless the Pentagon, as the biggest greenhouse gas emitting organization on the planet, is reined in considerably. And number two, um, where are you going to get the money for a, green, for a Green New Deal's program? The Pentagon budget is a big fat elephant in the room. On paper, they're getting over half, really. That's an artificially low figure. Military, if you count the VA, if you count all those CIA secret ops and black ops that we don't even know about, and all the nuclear weapons, which are in the energy department budget, it's really more like 70% a year going to our military adventures. So I knew that that, um, you know, that is the federally funded jobs program in Maine. Bath Ironworks is the biggest employer in Maine. It employs thousands of people in a state with very few good union jobs. So um, if we could, you know, turn the federal contracting toward building something we need or something to mitigate climate change or get us out of our cars, that would be a double win for climate 
no bombs, that's a win. Build something that helps, that's a second win. And the third big win would be obviously New Deal means it's a jobs program. We had research from the University of Maine at Amherst, I mean, University of Mass at Amherst, that had shown economists had built this model and put a billion dollars into their model in different sectors of the economy to see like how many good union jobs does that generate? Turns out building weapons is a terrible jobs program just in terms of how many jobs it generates. You would generate 50% additional jobs if you built clean energy systems instead of warships at that same facility with that same billion dollar investment. So I was really excited to learn about the other aspects of a complete Green New Deal like consumer owned and operated utilities, investing in regenerative agriculture so our food supply is sustainable. And I was really, really proud to carry that banner here in Maine. And just like how we said, for the young people, the people that are like in college now or just out of college or can't afford to go to college or struggling to pay their student loans, this platform resonated amazingly well with them. And as um, Bernie dropped out, or, you know, was no longer in the running. And then there was a very Bernie-like progressive in the Democratic primary for the Senate race here in Maine named Betsy Sweet. And she had a lot of young followers and a great volunteer base. And she uh, lost the primary to a very corporate centrist Democrat named Sarah Gideon. So we got a lot of the Bernie people and the Betsy Sweet people going, our hearts are broken, where do we go? Oh my gosh, look at this candidate. These are my values. Medicare for all was also became very, very important in our platform. Um, universal health care is, uh, a, you know, was a huge need before the pandemic. So many people lost their jobs and their health care. And in a pandemic, you know, if we don't have public health care, then our public health is going to be about as bad as it is right now. So Medicare for all also resonated hugely with um, the, pe the young people that came along. My base were the older uh, peace activists and climate, um, climate and militarism activists that I'd been you know, working with for years. That base stayed so engaged. I just got off a volunteer you know, celebration call with, um, and it was just about 50-50. It was the base, the people I've known for years and gotten arrested with or you know, bannered with or marched and protested with, and about half much younger people, many of whom had staff jobs um, with us as the campaign um, you know, became better funded and had a chance to pay people. It was really amazing luck that uh, a couple of elder greens told me early on, you wanna consider hiring Dave Schwab part-time for, for a comms director. So uh, Dave was in fact the first staff hire and they said, Dave is such a good fundraiser, he will more than make his salary back. So at the time, it was early days, we had very little money raised. And I was like, geez, you really think we can pay someone? They were like, you will never regret um, bringing Dave Schwab on. And boy, did that turn out to be true. Not just the fundraising part, obviously, eventually we had a fundraising director and we did really well. We raised, um, I think in the end, $185,000. Many, many people from around the country, probably people on this call right now, contributed. Greens were very generous with us and very supportive um, throughout. And that was amazing. But the best thing that Dave Schwab did was um, craft a message that was clear, that was um, compelling. And, um, you know, I knew enough to try to stay on message. I realized like I'm a communications person, really. I was trained as a journalist and I'm a blogger and, you know, teaching's really a communications job. But I really realized from watching the way Dave did it that, you know, staying focused on the message and finding a slightly different uh, way in or a way to, to couch it or, you know, a little flavoring or a little uh, style to put on it, but stay with your core message was super powerful and valuable. And Dave is just amazing at doing that in so many iterations, you know, so many different ways that he helped us um, uh, get that message out. We had many of the other progressive things on our plank. I think, you know, if you ever saw our issues page, we had a beautiful piece of uh, socialist realist art that one of my base here, Russell Ray, an artist here in Maine, had painted of a Green New Deal, like starting on the dark side and moving into the light. And then we had more issues and more substantive 
uh, material on our issues page than either of our opponents. Susan Collins ran on, I'm Susan Collins, I bring home the Navy bacon. If you don't elect me again, you're probably not gonna get any more Navy bacon. It was successful. She pulled off 51% in the first round. We never went to runoffs uh, because she managed to eke out a majority in the first round. Her opponent is Speaker of the House, um, Sarah Gideon, much younger uh, woman. The Democrat ran on I'm not Susan Collins. Her page website really had no issues on it other than like reproductive rights really ever, even until the end. Um, and there was one more independent in the race who was to the right of Susan Collins, big Trump supporter. And if you saw any of the debates that we had, there were four debates that we got into and we were excluded from the final fifth debate. But in the first two debates, this other independent, Max Lynn, put on a clown show, wouldn't answer the questions, cut up masks to show what he thought about that. And in some ways people were like, oh man, that really makes independence look frivolous. But in the other way, when it would be my turn to speak, people would say, wow, you sounded like the only grown up in the room because Max was doing a clown show and the other two, they would just do what politicians do in debates is recite their talking points. If they heard the word healthcare, they're giving you their healthcare talking points. I was actually trying to process the question and answer it in the time given. Um, and so uh, I had a really good team that coached me on debating. Dave was part of that effort too. And several other people really helped me understand how to, how to perform well in that uh, type of a setting. So once we hit the debates, it was like, then the campaign went into, I would say, phase two, uh, really ramped up. Donations and volunteers started flooding in. Um, and so now I understand why they work so hard to keep Greens and other third party candidates and independents out of debates, because we sound too good. And people go, oh my God, there's someone there who's talking about the issues. Oh my goodness, it's like an actual person who appears to be telling the truth and saying what she really thinks. So, you know, you wouldn't think that would be so remarkable, but in this particular race, it stood out um, a lot. <clears throat> and then um, we did something a little um, edgy in the final debate. It was the fourth debate. Collins had gone back to the Senate not to pass a relief bill for the people, oh no, to, you know, uh, hear a the Supreme Court confirmation which she voted no on because they didn't need her yes vote. Um, and so we did it all on Zoom. She had to Zoom, so the rest of us had to Zoom. So I did it from a hotel room in Portland where there was a Black Lives Matter uh, action going on that evening. And the organizer of that Black Lives uh, Matter main group, Hamdia Ahmed, who's a former Somali refugee, first person in her family to graduate college. She's quite young still, she's 22. I invited her to give my closing statement. And because it was a Zoom a debate, we were able to, um, you know, I had some of the team was in the room with me and Hamdia came in, I introduced her and then stepped aside and she gave the closing statement about why Black Lives Matter and why we need justice for Breonna Taylor. Um, and that was, uh, you know, not what people were expecting, but it made kind of a, a big impact with our base. Um, and I was really happy that we did that. That's not why we were excluded from the last debate. They had been working to exclude me and the other independent long since. It's a Hearst Corporation, ABC affiliate in Maine. And they said a bunch of things like, oh, she's not, they're not newsworthy enough. Well, by then we'd been in Politico, the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, and we were about to get in the New York Times. So that wasn't very plausible. And then they did some other stuff like, oh, she didn't raise enough money. Oh, she didn't pull high enough. Um, you know, we pulled around 5%, uh, 3%, 6%, I think 7% is the highest we ever got. Um, and as I said, we raised about $185,000. The problem is that TV station had let a person into the Senate debate two years ago when Angus King was running for reelection who was a Democrat, but didn't meet any of those criteria, uh, raised way less money than we did, polled about the same, had never run for elected office, so had no past performance. So really, that is an illegal campaign co contribution under FEC rules. If you're being kept out just because of your party, that's like an in-kind donation to the Republicans and Democrats. And uh, Max Lynn, the other, I was the only non-millionaire in the race, which I said a few times in debates, uh, the other independent is a retired financial planner. He lawyered up 
and filed a complaint with the FEC saying, hey, that was an illegal campaign contribution uh, on, their, on the part of WMTW and the Hearst Corporation. Are you going to do something about this? The FEC, I guess, doesn't have a quorum seated, so they can't hear complaints right now. But um, they, uh, you know, that legal action may, some legal action may ensue from that. Anyway, I think that uh, we got 40,000 votes. We got 5% of the vote. We were very disappointed that it didn't go to a runoff round because if Susan Collins had not quite made it to, uh, you know, right over 50%, then we would have seen how many number twos we got from Max Lynn. He got 1% of the vote. So, uh, he would have been crossed off under Maine's ranked choice voting law. And anybody that ranked me number two, um, we would have picked up those votes. You might think who would do that? You were really far left. He was really far right. But independent is a huge label in Maine that means a lot. And many people when I was out canvassing were like, oh, you're independent? Definitely. I'll take your palm card. I'm voting for you. Um, so I think many uninformed voters might possibly have said, oh, independent, let's rank her second. Also, a lot of my former students were old enough to vote. And I live up here in Trump country and Trump, uh, you know, uh, surrogates and Trump himself campaigned in the second district. They were working hard to get that one electoral vote because Maine, we split our electoral votes. We only have two congressional districts. And um, the second district had gone for Trump last time. So Maine gave three electoral votes to the Democrat and one to Trump. It worked again. And I think that's what bumped Susan Collins. She had never polled higher than 45% um, at any point in the run up. But incumbents always have an advantage, of course, because name recognition, because of the pork barrel that they've been providing. But also, the, I believe the GOP did a, a really, really strong voter turnout effort. I saw a lot of Trump voters in line with a lot of Trump insignia on down in southern Maine, where they are not so thick on the ground. And my guess is that a lot of those, they had pulled as undecided and, and probably want, while they were in there voting for their their uh, preferred president, they probably ranked uh, Susan Collins because they'd voted for her before and you know she was a known quantity. So um, we feel like it was a success in terms of we got a lot, a lot of earned media. Um, we did an advertising blitz at the end because we'd been fundraising pretty strong. We bought a lot of local radio, um, newspaper, <clears throat> digital advertising on newspaper sites and that kind of thing. Um, but we built a great network of grassroots, um, just kick-ass organizers that were out in the field um, all the time. <clears throat> Once the pandemic hit, we mostly did farmers markets because people wore masks there. It seemed safe. People were, uh, you know, following safety protocols. But there was an entire month of the campaign, you know, from the shutdown in mid-March when my teaching job just kind of evaporated on me. So that was kind of a lucky thing because I could really devote myself to this campaign and then I retired at the end of that school year a year earlier than planned but we for a month we raised no money we really couldn't do anything other than zoom and then slowly the momentum started to build again the retirees still you know they they didn't really lose any income in the pandemic shutdown they kept giving um we got back out there and started finding some ways to be out in the field. And then at the very end, we had an interesting thing happen, which was that a group that tries to flip Senate seats from Republican to Democrat had reached out to Sarah Gideon's campaign to say, hey, we could come to Maine in October and help you. We do street theater, we do tabling, we do canvassing, you know, we can help you out, uh, especially with younger voters. And the Gideon campaign wouldn't uh, listen to them, wouldn't respond. Same thing that happened when we said to the Gideon campaign, hey, you want a preference swap? I'll tell my people to rank you second. You tell your people to rank me second. The Gideon campaign started doing that like one week before the election was over. But we had realized way back when, you know, that's probably to our advantage. Anyway, the Flip 2020 group got heard nothing from the Gideon campaign. So they reached out to us and we said, sure, 
you know, come on down. So if you've maybe seen a video of a bunch of animals dressed up on Halloween, you know, with the, one of my, with our uh, field manager, Amanda Leach, playing Lisa Fermain as a superhero, flying in and saving them from the corporate Democrats and Republicans, um, you know, that was the sort of flip 2020 favor. They did a bike rally through Portland with us. And, you know, so a lot of uh, canvassing at night, handing out our Medicare for all condoms. That was probably our best merch, or at least the merch I felt the best about was we had Medicare for all, Lisa Fermain branded condoms because we want to protect you with universal health care. Um, so it was a constant, it was like a constant series of pivots and like, oh my gosh, now what? And I felt like we were flexible problem solvers throughout. We had some really good people that stayed with us once they got involved. And I just feel really lucky to have met so many wonderful people and learned so much and, you know, really had a, a great experience. Um, I think that's probably about all I had to say. And I imagine you might have some questions. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. And um, I just want to reiterate that uh, I didn't ask Lisa to say nice things about me. Uh, <laughs> that was totally unexpected, um, but appreciate it. Um, and I could say a lot of nice things about Lisa in return, but we only have a few minutes for questions. Um, so I've seen one so far from Barb. Um, and if there are any other questions, please get them up soon. Uh, cause we'll, we have Angela Walker joining us at three 30 and I know Lisa has a volunteer celebration today to go to. So, uh, I'm sure we have to let her go in a couple of minutes, but yeah, we're getting lots of appreciation for Lisa in the comments. And Barb, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Am I unmuted now? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Could you see yourself running for president in 2024? Thanks for that question, Barb. No, I could not see myself running for president in 2024. Um, Howie and Jill both came to Maine when they were running and um, I was you know, able to meet them at that time. And we got to do some campaigning together with Howie actually, we did a bunch of interviews that day and we're out in the field a bit. Um, I know Maine really well. And I felt that even though I hadn't run for elected office, I was elected vice president, chief negotiator, in my um, local bargaining unit of the teachers union, but um, you know, it was a pretty big bite to run for a uh, senator. Um, I don't, I couldn't believe in myself as a presidential candidate. And I'm 64 years old. I don't think I have the physical stamina to run a national, you know, in a national election like that. I was continually amazed by Howie and Angela and how much energy and, you know, just sheer hard work they put into it. I really admire that. I am a hardworking person, but I'm, I'm not as young as I used to be. So um, I'm not sure what the future holds for me. Definitely going to stay involved with, um, you know, the progressives and the Greens here in Maine and, um, um, you know, support younger people who want to try this uh, uh, amazing experience. Yeah, I will say keep an eye on Lisa. I have a feeling we haven't heard the last of her. And Lisa has been, you know, Howie has been running on a Green New Deal since 2010. 